Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to this webinar today on Concolian Women in Medicine. Um, my name is Dr. Abdullah Gujar and I'm CPD lead and executive for CAMCA UK. A couple of housekeeping rules for this uh, meeting. Uh, all participants will remain muted and their videos would be off as well. We need to record this meeting and later on we will share on our social media and YouTube channel and participants can ask the questions in the chat box and the chairs and the panelists will pick up these questions and they will do the discussion in the panelists session. Um, I'll quickly play the national anthem because it's 14th of August, our Independence Day. I will now introduce um, our chairperson of CAMCA UK, Dr. Muhammad Tufel. He is a consultant pulmonologist at Glenfield Hospital, Leicester. I'll hand over the podium to Dr. Muhammad Tufel now. Um, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, thank you, uh, Abdullah, for the uh, kind uh, introduction. And I welcome you all on behalf of uh, CAMCA UK, CAMCANA, and CAMU. Uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, over the years, and especially over the last uh, 18 months, we have uh, organized many webinars, but uh, really I'm very much proud of this particular webinar where we find the opportunity to celebrate the achievements uh, of our Temkolian women uh, in medicine. And, and their achievements are immense and without any controversy, and they should be uh, recognized. Um, as you know, um, if we look at the history, the, the role of women has been as a natural healer, um, whether they are nurses, midwives, or doctors, or even surgeons, and the history dates back to um, uh, centuries. We do feel at times that uh, um, their achievements are not recognized in the way they, they should be recognized. From our platform, really, we want to encourage female doctors, especially the Temkolian um, women, to explore opportunities throughout the world and overcome uh, many challenges uh, they face uh, as compared to their uh, male uh, counterparts. And um, I'm very pleased that, uh, and I'm very thankful to all the speakers and panelists and who are the leaders and uh, um, who have got accomplishment in, in their own um, fields. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this uh, uh, webinar uh, where they will uh, discuss about uh, achievements, challenges, opportunities, and how we can be more equal and bring diversity in in our in our in our lives. So I'm very much uh, thankful to our own team, our executive committee, especially our secretary, Dr. Tominda Dougal, who has been instrumental in organizing all of this. Dr. Atar Saeed, Abdullah, Asif, and uh, also I'm very much. Um, um, obliged and uh, thankful to uh, Professor Khalan Masood Gondal Sahib, who is our patron, and Professor Mahmoud Shok, and our special guests, um, uh, Professor Yasmin Rashid and, uh, and Dr. Faisal Sultan, to give us this opportunity uh, to uh, to run this uh, webinar uh, from this uh, uh, forum. So really, I think it, it, is a, it is a good and unique opportunity uh, for us all. Um, to celebrate the um, contributions of Kampulian women uh, in um, medicine. So without any ado, I would like to 
um, invite uh, Dr. Aslam, who is the president of uh, Kamkana USA, and he has always been very helpful to us and for his collaboration uh, with us. And uh, as you know, we have got many speakers from USA as well. And um, um, very much uh, thankful to him uh, for accepting our invitation and for collaborating with us. So uh, I will pass on to Dr. Aslam. Bismillah rahman rahim uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Tufel, for your kind introduction. Again, my name is Muhammad Aslam. I'm a professor of psychiatry at the uh, University of Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, currently president of Kemkana. I just want to say thank you to Dr. Tufel and uh, Dr. Tabinda Dugal, Dr. Atar Saeed, and all the Kemka UK members to giving us the opportunity to be part of this uh, great webinar. As you said, Dr. Tufel, I think, um, I think our uh, women need to recognize in the healthcare and in the field of medicine, especially the component of uh, women, they have been making stride in the field of medicine, especially in UK and United States, and they need to have recognition again. Uh, you know, being a woman, they are mothers and they are daughters, sisters, and they have a lot of responsibility at home. But uh, despite that, I think I'm really proud of our Congolian women that they've been in a forefront of a field of medicines, uh, as you can see the names. Uh, uh, I, with that, I also would like to thank all the participants, attendees to giving me the opportunities. Uh, I think it's a great honor that we are celebrating the Independence Day as we heard the national anthem, and we are celebrating the women, Congolian women, inshallah, in this day. Uh, with that, I would like to thank some of the special guests, Dr. Um, Sultan, special assistant to Prime Minister. He was here last month in uh, Orlando, Florida for our annual meeting. We were very thankful and uh, that he was able to make, uh, um, to come to our meeting despite his very busy schedule. Of course, Dr. Yasmin Rash has been very busy and she has been part of this webinar. We want to thank you her. Uh, of course, uh, thank you, Dr. Professor, uh, Professor Khalid Masood Gondal Saab. He has been very busy. He just came from the ceremony of Independence Day, as he said earlier. And with that, I think I would like to invite our worthy and respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Khalid Masood Gondal Saab, to say some insightful uh, remarks and some few remarks about the webinar. Thank you very much again, everyone. Really appreciated all the uh, Kamka UK members for inviting us. Bismillah rahim Thank you, Dr. Asman Saab, and thank you, Dr. Tufel and Kamka UK for organizing this international webinar on this very historical day on a very important topic, Kamkolian Women in Medicine. And congratulation to all the audience on the Independence Day. King Edward Medical University has completed 161 years of excellence in the medical education. And by the grace of Allah Almighty, its alumni, faculty, and the students have been playing a leading role nationally and internationally. In the current COVID pandemic, faculty of King Edward Medical University has played unprecedented role in service delivery, research, establishing the Department of Telemedicine national and international webinar and infrastructural development. Kemka UK have arranged two par excellence international seminar and webinar on health reform and guideline, their, their guidelines they were published in Annals of King Edward Medical University. In both these international uh, activities, our honorable federal and provincial ministers for health, Dr. Faisal Sultan and Professor Dr. Yasmin Rachid guided us and shared government vision and now with MPI implementation, with my elder brother, Professor Mahmoud Shokat as the chairman, we will try to follow the VN and come up to the expectation of the government in health reform and quality service delivery. Before discussing the role of Kemkolian women in medicine, I will just quote a few examples of unprecedented contribution and role of the women. Urdu mein baat karte hue, chaudha saal hum qabal jayen, to nubuvat ki saathi tasalli dene wali, Jinka Mal Islam ki khatar or Zindagi bhi Islam ki khatar. Hazrat Khadija tul Kubra, Raziyallahu ta'ala anha, 
आदीस उम्मत तक पहुंचाने वाली हजरत आयशा सिद्दीका जन्नती औरतों की सरदार हजरत फातमत जारा इस्लाम की पहली शहीदा हजरत सुमैया गजबात में मरहम पट्टी करने वाली सहाबिया और कामल वलिया हजरत राबिया बसरी ये सब हमारे लिए रोल मॉडल हैं आज चौदह अगस्त का दिन है और खातन का आजादी की जिदोजहद में मुसलमा किरदार रहा मोहतरमा फातमा जना का कायद अजम मोहम्मद अली जना का साथ क्याम पास क्याम पाकिस्तान का बायस बना और दौरे हाजिर में आई थिंक आई कैन कोट द एग्जाम्पल ऑफ प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर यासमिन राशद एज द लीडर एज द टीचर एज द रोल मॉडल रिसर्च स्कॉलर एंड द मैंटर इन द फील्ड ऑफ मेडिकल एजुकेशन एंड सर्विस डिलीवरी एंड नाउ हर अन प्रेसिडेंटेड रोल इन द कोविड पेंडेमिक इन इम्प्रूवमेंट ऑफ हेल्थ सिस्टम ऑफ प्रोविंस to effective strategies the most important aspect is that she remains on forefront available 24 by 7 for ailing humanity under all circumstances women in king edward medical university alumni led the profession at international level may it be kemka uk kemkana apna i think i just i can just quote a few example professor tabinda dogal professor naid usmani dr aisha najib Dr Aisha Zafar and so many others they are the leaders of the medical profession at King Edward Medical University we have got a few examples professor Bilkis Shabeer professor Saira Afsal professor Aisha Shaukat and other faculty member they are playing the pivotal role may it be the post graduate program like the breast surgery gastroenterology endocrinology rheumatology establishment of department of telemedicine organizing national and international webinar and research during covid our role as the member of corona expert advisory committee our role in formulating the various guideline at the level of the provincial government ladies and gentlemen in the end while appreciating this great academic activity on independence day i must appreciate the presence of dr shiri munir the great leader and advocate of women empowerment and last year she addressed the final year mbbs students of king edward medical university and students were greatly inspired by her contribution and by her motivational address and finally thank you very much dr kufail president dr atramat said dr aslam dr tabinda and all the organize or all the organizer honorable panelists speaker participant ladies and gentlemen pakistan zindabad king edward medical university pindabad thank you and thank you very much uh, thank you uh, dr gondal thank you very much and assalam alaikum to everybody uh, i would like to thank professor mahmood shaukat who is my co chair really honored to have him as my co chair um, and i'd uh, ask him to to say a few words once the speakers have finished their talks Uh, but let me um, just uh, introduce uh, the first speaker. We've got some uh, very uh, eminent speakers. They people who have done ever so well in their fields. Um, and I will introduce uh, first up uh, Dr. Farzana Sadiqi, who's a consultant gynecologist, and she's going to talk about the COVID challenges in medicine to women. And I uh, then Professor Mahmood Shaukat can introduce Mary Taj, who comes after um, Dr. Farzana Sadiqi. So, without much uh, ado, I uh, will uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Farzana Sadiqi. But before that, um, may I also say um, a few words about Professor Mahmood Shaukat, who is a very eminent. pediatric surgeon and a, a retired professor of pediatric surgery he's also in charge of the mti and i think he has done ever so well with the mti mti since he's taken over so again as i say i'm extremely honored to have him as my co chair thank you very much professor mamu chokar uh, so uh, uh, over to you dr farzana sadiqi please okay thank you very much um for having me on bismillahir rahmanir rahim and i am going to start my first slide um sorry i'm a bit 
lost here. Okay. So um, my topic, as you can see, is the challenges that have been posed by the COVID pandemic. Now, as you know, that working in healthcare, we are already trained to deal with emergencies and we are working in risk-taking environments. But unexpectedly, this COVID-19, that was something which we were not prepared for and which, which we were not familiar. Now, having spoken to different colleagues in the field, each one was affected differently and each one has got a story to tell. However, in the current time frame, I felt that it might be more useful if I spoke about my individual experience in my practice working in Greater Manchester in community gynecology and sexual health. Now, the first important development that happened with the COVID with everybody else was how the doctors and the patients, they quickly embraced the use of telemedicine to access healthcare. Now, for the smart IT savvy individual, there was advantages, and especially if the problem was not very serious. However, I felt that the vulnerable ones, such as the poor ones, the older ones, and the disabled ones, they were left behind. The restricted access to healthcare, and it was harrowing to see empty waiting rooms and desert deserted corridors, and that was the clinics were being canceled in order to ensure social distancing in the workplace. Now this worked totally against the grain of the NHS, that is to improve access to healthcare for the needy and in a prompt and a quick way. During this time, I also felt that seeing the patients through the use of telemedicine, either on online consultations or telemedicine, the doctor-patient relationship was greatly affected. Now this relationship is extremely important in medicine and because face-to-face -face consultations, they reduce the gap between the patient and the clinician and enforces the relationship of trust and compassion. Now, I was working in frontline and unfortunately I, uh, I, I was in a, in a position uh, that I had to, I was not able to work from home and therefore I had to triage the patients and decide how many more times I have to continue with teleconsultation before I bring them in for a face-to-face -face appointment. This was quite challenging because I was worried about the fear of contracting the virus and not only that, spreading it to others and also bringing it home, bringing it home to my patients and family members. I have seen the distress of the patients and especially in gynecology who the women suffered with severe serious pelvic pains and bleeding issues. They were desperate and they would ask me that is there no way we can get an ultrasound scan or can we go private? However, as you know, all amenities were closed and it was a total um, shutdown. The, I was worried whether I am going to delay a diagnosis, especially for the time sensitive conditions such as cancers. And is there any danger of me increasing the problems that already existed. There were also delays in treatment and investigations, and I was worried that I am unable to feel for the lymphadenopathy, or I am unable to uh, uh, hear the chest or listen to the chest, and therefore there was a danger or over, over prescribing. I remember this young lad who was 21 years old, and he was suffering for sore throat, temperature, and he was unable to walk and had a funny rash. And his COVID test was negative, but he came back as uh, positive for HIV. So that brought home to me that yes, it is COVID, but it is not all about COVID. There were other illnesses that were still at large. We also hear about a case of an individual whose pancreatic cancer was delayed to be diagnosed by 18 months. And therefore he was unable to unfortunately access the early medical treatment and sort out his other affairs. During the teleconsultations, I was also uncertain of the patient's capacity to decide. And sometimes I did have concern about the vulnerable patients who were accessing healthcare through homes, through domestic violence, and when there was concerns about abuse, uh, abuse and other um, coercion. 
the learning disability patients, they have had a very difficult time, especially who had severe serious mental health conditions, speech difficulties, blind and the deaf people. And not all of them can access uh, telemedicine. There is evidence that one fifth of individuals in the UK, they don't have access to smartphones and 14% of individuals do not have a working broadband. A survey was done by NHS Digital and 42% of the people, they said that the use of uh, uh, telemedicine was not going to improve the quality of their care. Needless to say that the use of telephone interpreters is quite tricky in normal situations. However, it was far from ideal and a challenge during the uh, pandemic. However, I just want to bring to your attention the new practice prescribing guidance that has just been published by the GMC. And it is worth a read because it all gives us the option that we must give to all our patients to bring them in for a face-to-face -face consultation. And as always, justify your actions and documentations in case there is a comeback. On the, the other important lesson that I heard was that of fear, which I touched, about, about, touched upon. And then this information that we were listening or hearing about the minority, minority ethnic staff who were disproportionately affected and from the risk of catching the disease, as well as the hospital admissions from COVID related illness and the COVID deaths. So this was extremely and incredibly um, stressful situation. And many of us know friends, colleagues and family members who have succumbed to this uh, illness. I was also very worried about the vaccine hesitancy among my colleagues at work and there was this news about myths about the COVID and the corona, as well as the vaccine that still exists in the social media. And all this added to elements of stress and anxiety. Here are some of the, I would like to pay tribute to all these individuals who very quickly succumbed to the disease in the line of their duty. Now, all, this, uh, all these issues that I have raised inevitably have created a huge backlog. And this week we heard headlines that over 5 million people are waiting in the UK to, for their hospital appointments. And I suspect that this number can easily be doubled or trebled for those patients who, were, uh, who are in the community or in the primary care because they self-refer themselves. Now, on the background of increased workload, chronic staff shortages, which we are familiar with, and we know we were already running at full capacity, this is going to compound the problem. The other point I just wanted to raise is that all the training placements for medical and nursing training, they were all suspended during the pandemic, and therefore the in-house training has been seriously disrupted. And inevitably, this is going to have an effect on the future workforce in terms of trained personnel and further pressure on the, on the working environment. So my reflections are that this pandemic is still uncertain. There is a lot of unpredictable nature of the, uh, of the condition and all the healthcare systems in the world have been stretched and there is a, a, a need for them to agilely work to improve the community care they, we serve. There is uncertainty over the changing data. And the other concerns are the long COVID, whereas one third of the effect, infected people are suffering from this. There are estimates that about a million people are living with the long COVID in the UK and its sequelae. The Delta variant is also a concern because it is highly transmissible and it can also affect all the individuals who have already been doubly vaccinated. And if, as the experts pre, uh, predict, if there is a third wave or the variant changes, then the game will change once again. I am still seeing patients in my clinics who are unvaccinated. And again, that brings home a bit of fear and anxiety about the risk of catching the uh, COVID. And then also worries how long the immunity is going to last and what is going to happen in the future. 
However, looking ahead, I still feel that I would like to uh, end on a positive note that there are opportunities to work together and share the lessons we have learned and celebrate our successes and opportunities. It is very important for our, us to book our study leaves and annual leaves in advance so that we avoid the concerns with fatigue and uh, burnout. And it is okay not to feel okay on certain days and it is perfectly fine to speak to somebody that we can trust if we are feeling low. And do remember that we must step up the vaccination campaign because no one is safe until everyone is safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farzana, for this insightful talk. And we will reserve the questions till all the um, speakers have finished. So. I would like to invite uh, Professor Mehmood Chokot to introduce the next speaker, please. Oh, yes, thank you very much. But uh, could I ask you, because uh, I haven't had a recent update on Mary, I know her very well, but I, I, it would be a little um, faulty if I introduce her now because I, have had, I haven't heard about her for quite some time and I didn't know the speakers. So okay. would, I, would it be okay to ask you okay. to introduce It's okay. Her? All right. Okay. So Mary, Mary I, I know Mary for a very long time. She's one of my informal mentors and she's a great friend and she's I know that she's a, a very eminent pediatrician and she now does pediatric oncology at the Royal Marsden and uh, she is a role model for many including me and uh, I'll ask uh, Mary, Mary Taj to um, continue her talk please. Uh, thank you uh, Tabinda and the management team for inviting me to talk on this important topic and uh, uh, thank you Mahmood. We worked together at King Edward so I, uh, I'm sure you still remember me but uh, it's, it has been a long time. So uh, just going straight into my topic as, as I researched into this I realized that there are two types of gender inequalities in medicines, the gender inequalities for women working in medicine and gender inequalities in terms of how uh, health outcomes for women. And then there is this wide gap in terms of women living in rural and urban areas. Growing up, I must say that I did not experience any gender inequality and I've always been very thankful to Pakistan for giving me a good education that has stood me uh, in good stead. Can you all hear me? Can Tabinda is this yes, so? We can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. So I've always been thankful to Pakistan for my education, uh, which has enabled me to work uh, in different countries of the world. So I come from a small town uh, called Wa, and I uh, also belong to an ethnic minority. But with family support, I was able to go to a good school, college, and then graduated from KE. Within a short time of graduation, I went alone to the UK where I did my diploma in child health and did my N MRCP in child health. And within three years, I came back through the Public Service Commission. I became an assistant professor at KE, got married, and after marriage, again with family support, went on to do a fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology at Ann Arbor in Michigan, where I also had my two children. So currently I'm working as a consultant pediatric oncologist, and I'm also chair of the UK N NCRI pediatric NHL group. And in fact, have also been able to, uh, to uh, do my, uh, to carry forward my interest of continuing to work uh, with other groups in developing countries, and particularly, I'm a member of the Pediatric Society of uh, Pediatric Oncology, Pakistan Society of Pediatric Oncology, and have been working with the unit at Children's Hospital in Lahore. But this is not the story for all women, and that's why uh, this topic is so important. According to the Pakistan Demographic and Health Survey 2017-19, literacy is uh, for, for rural women is only 41% with 61% of the urban women being literate. Higher education, uh, there, is an ev uh, there is a bigger divide based on wealth and women from the lowest wealth quintiles only two of them, 2.2% go on to have higher education, where 31, whereas 31% of women from the highest 
wealth quintiles go on to have higher education. So in Pakistan, gender inequality is based on where you live as well as how wealthy your family is. And Pakistan is 153rd out of 156th in terms of gender gap, according to the World Economic Forum. So you would imagine that once women become uh, doctors, they would be very well respected and people would praise them for what they have achieved. But there is a this, this comes from my recent reading. There is still a lot of misconception, and people are saying women get married and leave the profession, and a boy would feed the family and would have made a better um, individual becoming a doctor. There's also this term doctor brides, which I came across, and this refers to women doctors who who get who go into medicine only to find good matches. And then it's said that 70% of graduate doctors are female, but only 50% will practice. In 2014, the PMDC wanted to restrict women in medical college to 50%, but this decision was later struck down by the high court. And it is still true that some women find that uh, supporting their families and uh, problems with in-laws means that they cannot have a good work-life balance and leave medicine, but so do some men. Men choose to have other professions after they graduated. So I looked at some data and uh, um, what people quote is the fact that there are more men doctors at the present time than female, but that's because until 2004, there were more male doctors graduating than women doctors. But since 2008, the number of, of doctors registering with PMDC, um, the female doctors have continued to increase. And in the future, we are likely to have a workforce uh, within medicine that is more female than male. And just looking at uh, what the what is the outcome for the women who these women treat, according to the Pakistan Maternal Mortality Survey of 2019, the percentage of female deaths that are maternal are still very high at 13.5%. And the maternal mortality, mortality ratio is still 186. So we the women that we should be benefiting are still not getting the treatment they need. So what are the solution? I know the government is, uh, has introduced health cards and there are mother and children units that are, that are being established and which will help with the outcomes. But this, uh, th this phenomena of having more female uh, and male than male doctor graduates is also seen in the West. And we really need to make our work, uh, 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 make our hospitals more women and child friendly so that, that we can retain women in the workforce. In pediatrics in the UK, they have been more women for a very long time. And things that have been introduced are like job shares for junior female doctors, improved rotors and working hours for both men and women. Um, in Pakistan, especially in the rural areas, there should be improved security in the workplace, improved facilities in rural health units, and public education that Dr. Brides is a myth. Most women doctors do an amazing job. Their number, as we, I've said, is going up and that we need to make our workplaces more child-friendly. And uh, uh, if this is done in the early years, then you will have experienced female doctors uh, giving, contributing to the profession for many, many years to come. And then when we have women in leadership positions, we, we need them to be empathetic, supportive, and fair to both male and female doctors, both single and married. And then you will have a, working, a happy workplace. Thank you very much. I introduce the next speaker uh, who is um, a speaker um, from the US and she is Shirin Munir who is a um, staff scientist in respiratory viruses and vaccine development at the NIH Maryland 
And uh, for those of you who don't know Shireen, she was uh, the one who took um, the case to the High Court to have equal opportunities uh, to lift the quota system for women in medical schools. And therefore, I think a lot of uh, women uh, currently may owe their uh, degree to Shireen in a way. So uh, thank you, Shireen, for today. And um, over to you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you, Tabinda, for the kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank KEMC Alumni Association for organizing this great event, an important event indeed, and for inviting me. Um, relevant to today's discussion on women in medicine, I will remind you how hard it was uh, around 30 years ago for women to even get into medical schools in Pakistan and how we went about achieving equal representation of women in medical training. Up until 1990, there was a quota system. A women had a limited quota of seats for which they competed among themselves. It, it used to take an extraordinary amount of effort from women to get admission as compared to male students. There were separate merit lists for male and female students. It was like that for for decades, uh, I, I guess, since partition or even before that. And I will remind you that when a group of people are, are discriminated for a very long time, that, that becomes a societal norm. Everyone accepts it and it is not thought of as something uh, of injustice anymore. This was the case here as well. This extreme case of discrimination was never challenged and there were no complaints. My um, own ambition when I was young was to study medicine. I knew the path to this aim was quite difficult, maybe unattainable given the admission criteria at the time, but I never was shy of working hard, so I, I went for it. Uh, right from early grade school, I, I kept this goal at the, at the forefront of all my activities and decisions. And as a result, I did quite well in my pre-medical grades and was very hopeful that, that I was going to get admitted in, in the 1986 batch. That was the time when I had completed my pre-medical pre training. When, I, when one decides to pursue a certain profession, it involves many things like their personal interest, their natural talent to do so, and also their emotional engagement as, uh, as a profession chosen for, for, to pursue it for the rest of their lives, then that person makes that happen, of course, with hard work. But when one does all of these things with dedication and when they are the closest to their destination, they are told, no, you can't get in no matter how good you are and no matter how hard you worked. Why? Because your gender is a problem, you are a woman. So this is what happened to me and many other women in 1986. Even though women were already struggling with limited quota and with the limited opportunity, in 1986, the, the Punjab government decided to cut down women quota even further uh, on the basis of the point that, that women did not practice medicine after graduation and the government had to spend enormous amount of funds to, to uh, make female doctors. So here I will become the voice of women at that time and the times before us in explaining how it felt. We had better credentials than many male students who got admitted, but we were denied the right to education just because of one reason alone, and that was our gender. Being a female felt like a punishable offense at the time, and we were declared a group of citizens with lesser rights. And this was indeed terrible. At that time, government medical colleges were the major institutions uh, in, in Punjab at least available for studying medicine with very limited or not much private options. As far as I am concerned, I was basically in shock and, and did not know what to do next as I never had a plan B. I, I think people may tolerate oppression for a certain to a certain level, but when it reaches a breaking point, someone is bound to raise voice against it, and that happened to be mine. My father, uh, Sayyid Munir Hussain, was a professor in, in Punjab University Law School and also practiced law in Lahore. 
he served as my attorney and we filed a petition against this uh, discriminatory, discriminatory decision of the government. As Dr. Ajaz Essen, a late KEMC principal used to say, it, it is extremely important to safeguard and protect the constitution of the country. And it was the constitution of Pakistan that provided protection for the rights of women. It clearly states that women shall never be discriminated based on their gender and that discrimination would be permissible only in special circumstances when women and children would need extra protection, but they will never be discriminated to protect men. So we filed the petition in Lahore High Court, which we won on the grounds that this was a clear violation of the constitution. The court then abolished the women quota system and ordered to instate open merit where women and men would equally compete with each other and not that women will compete among themselves. The struggle did not end there. There was an appeal against this decision in the Supreme Court, but we did not give up and actively fought the case uh, for almost four years. And finally, in 1990, the Supreme Court also decided in our favor and upheld the decision of the Lahore High Court. I can't explain in words how good it felt. This was not only a historic and revolutionary event for Pakistani women, this also was indeed an, an emotional moment and, and a moment of joy and relief provided to us by our constitution and the justice system. Most importantly, it felt reassuring that, that the rule of law still existed. And just a, a, a pre-medical student can stand up for her rights and, and sue the government and have the decision made in her favor because she was right. So women overall are viewed differently from men in our culture. They, they are viewed as a mother, sister, daughter, and an object of pride, and rightly so. All the change is happening and, and women are coming forward in the professional workforce, but still the majority thinks of women's role in, in the society as someone who supports the family and raises children. Most of women are not fully supported to adopt a profession and contribute at the societal and country level. Winning this case uh, is a symbol and a legal precedent that women can't be discriminated in education anymore. But this removes only the first hurdle. But the, prime, the mindset of the society also needs to be changed. Equal right to education will not mean anything till women are supported by their families and the government to put their education into practice and prove that they are not merely trophy wives. They could be much more than that if they don't have to choose between their family and profession. Public insight and, and government programs can support women to excel and, and become an indispensable component of the economy of Pakistan, which is desperately needed at this time as women of, uh, after all make up to close to 50% of our population. And with this, I would like to thank uh, KEMC Association UK for having me and for giving me this opportunity to present my views. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Shireen. And before I introduce the panelists and open it for panel discussion and a wider discussion, I would like to ask Professor Mahmood Shokat to say a few words. We have about 20 minutes for the discussion. So um, I will um, open it for discussion after Professor Mahmood Shokat has said a few words. Um, Professor Mahmood Shokat, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. It was indeed a pleasure listening to all the three speakers who spoke uh, in all the possible uh, uh, good words, the issues that are being faced by the uh, women population of this country. I think this was a brilliant idea to not only put on record the tremendous work uh, you know, that is by society and that was usually unappreciated. So that's the first thing that I would like to put on record, that this is a great idea, rather than just doing it the way typically all these celebrations are done without any objective, just hoisting a flag and just congratulating each other. I think this is a good idea of appreciating the work of the people, number one, 
also in the process highlighting the issues that really are uh, uh, at the forefront for not only the women of the society, uh, yes, it is. everybody who contribute in any particular uh, field. I think Pakistan has had a very, very uh, uh, unfortunately uh, bad period of, in, in, in terms of its history lately that uh, it has become much more concentrated in society, the concepts in, in the concepts of exploitation. The exploitation of the weaker and the marginalized uh, segments of the society, be that the uh, less fortunate uh, uh, women folk or, or the economically deprived people or uh, the people who have had no access to formal education. I think these are all the, all the segments which have been marginalized and uh, the state does not really uh, come forward to support them and to protect their rights and to protect their uh, careers and to provide equal opportunities to provide access to justice and equality in terms of uh, opportunities. I think these are the issues that really need to be looked into. And I, I, I think that's a great start because uh, we can't leave it to the politicians. We can't leave it to the public who's really uneducated. We cannot leave it to the people who are in the habit of exploiting because uh, any change would really be detrimental to their own existence and, and they, they wouldn't bring that change. In, in, in societies and countries like Pakistan, I think it's the consumer pressure that makes the governments do anything sensible. Otherwise, they are so well uh, sort of uh, committed to their own well-being that you can't really think of any good coming out of the present system. So I think we need to really bring this out of our own profession and, and one day perhaps we can bring it to the professionals groups as a whole because uh, it, these things are not limited to the women working in medicine only. These are uh, the everyday problems of women working in, every, in any field, in every field. But I think having said that, it's not that depressing and that oppressive also. And we've had some good uh, openings for women. We've had some good openings for uh, people who are starting their own work and um, who have the ability to excel because I have this uh, belief that uh, societies which are not very well uh, sort of growing in terms of economic situation, these are the same societies that provide you a great opportunity to, to deliver, to really do something wonderful, to do miracles. And I think Pakistani society at the moment is one of those societies where there's so much vacuum that anybody who wants to do something has uh, uh, limitless opportunities of delivering. So not only should we appreciate the work of the women who are doing this work, not only should we highlight the issues, but we need to really work towards the solutions. And one good news that I can tell you that Mary was talking about sharing, uh, time sharing and uh, these things. I've put forward a scheme where we're developing a, a referral system for Lahore in which I propose this. I don't know whether that's going to be accepted by the government or not, where I propose this, that women who are living in a community can run a health center and we don't have to have fixed work hours for them. They have to deliver so many hours a day and they can share that between a group of three or four or five, whoever uh, wants to join that group. And then we can calculate their share of uh, salary on the basis of the uh, uh, amount of work and hours that they put in. So I think we're working on those lines and uh, uh, it's difficult to bring a change in a, in a, in a conservative and medieval sort of uh, uh, setting. But I think the, the trick is to continue to work, to continue to highlight and to continue to make an effort. Uh, I, I would thank all the speakers because uh, this was really very helpful and beneficial for me at least. And I think uh, we can think of such novel uh, 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 sort of uh, topics in the future also, so that we can contribute not only to our own profession, but to the other ones. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mahmood Chokot. Really grateful to you. Uh, so I will be opening this to the panel, uh, but before I do that, I'd like to introduce the panelists. So um, in addition to the speakers, the two speakers, uh, the three speakers, uh, we also have um, Aisha Najib joining in from the West Coast of the USA. Thank you, Aisha, very early in the morning. And I see um, Dr. Nahid Usmani has also joined in. Thank you, uh, Nahid. Um, and uh, I have got uh, Mehreen Chaudhary, who is a, a GP uh, in Dulwich, London. I, I have got Nadia uh, Fatma Jabbar, who is a radiologist in uh, Liverpool. She lives in Manchester, but commutes, commutes to Liverpool, which has got its own challenges. And Nadia can say a word or two about that. Um, I, um, 
I, one of the panelists remarked on the fact that uh, her son said that, oh, it's a woman's um, issue, and then you have got so many men in there to talk. The thing is, though, however, we cannot proceed without mutual consultations. And it's like, it, it's talking to each other and taking it forward. And no decisions can be made without the uh, inclusion of men. And similarly, without inclusion of women, no decisions should be made about them. And, and I think it's, it's just how jointly we can raise better um, men or boys who will become men and who will know more about how to share and how to do things in a better way than what is now. Uh, so uh, open to the panel, but uh, I would like to ask the first question, please. Um, so um, I, there has been a, a very, um, I guess, uh, an insightful comment from uh, one of um, the, the uh, participants, uh, Kokab Nasir, who has remarked on the fact that women who um, graduate as medical graduates and then choose not to work, um, should there be any incentives or um, things put in place for them to continue to work? Uh, so this is open to the panel, to discussion and to the speakers. Um, if, if Mary wants to answer that, please. Yes, please. I, I'm very happy to uh, talk on this because uh, in my 10 minute talk, obviously I could not elaborate, but a part of what I meant about changing the, uh, the working conditions uh, taking into account that there are now more female doctors, there are going to be more female doctors than male, was to make sure that, the, uh, that, that this was appreciated, that women still had to run a house and look after children. And while the changes in society are taking place, we need to make sure that the workplace is also um, friendlier for women than it has been. Uh, I mean, I don't, uh, as a woman, I've always done my fair share of duties and I will still expect women in the future to do it. But if rotas are made so that uh, they, both men and women don't have to work the extremely long hours that I used to when I was doing my house job, it would be helpful for all. Also, um, th this uh, in pediatrics, having a job share is now, quite commonly practiced where two females work part-time, but you have one full-time equivalent. That helps uh, women achieve this uh, work-life balance. And maybe something like this could be thought of. And, and Dr. Mahmood Shokat, uh, Professor Mahmood Shokat just mentioned that he, he was proposing something like this in the community where four or five women could work together and put in the required number of hours uh, according to their uh, their own uh, flexible working, so that those kind of schemes would be very much welcomed. And um, as uh, women get older, then they are able to put in more hours, in their work. and will be retained in medicine. Because I don't think any woman leaves medicine without a heavy heart. It's only when they absolutely find that their marriage or their children are suffering that they come to this very difficult decision. And also as more and more women come into the leadership position, they should be more supportive of women and looking out for them. So open to the panel, please. Uh, if, if anybody uh, from the panel wants to ask, and there are several okay. questions which the participants have asked, so I can leave that till the very end. Uh, can I say a few words, Tavinder? Yes. yes, yes. So I think this is really important. I think the journey for women pretty much reflect everything that I went through. When I was applying to medical colleges after my FSC, with, with all my friends, I wanted to apply to Fatma Jinnah and my father put his foot down. He said, you are going to live your life in a world of men you should know. You should be educated with the men, uh, you know, and it should not be separate. And that was the decision that led to my going into King Edward. There are a few issues that need to be addressed both at, a, at the systematic level as well as individual level, yes. Women are constrained and mm -hmm. cannot go back into active working mm -hmm. life. Uh, firstly, there are you know, models that are being developed and are existing in Pakistan, like Sehat Kahani, 
which is a telemedicine project, I think out of Karachi, where they are doing telemedicine uh, for uh, under, uh, in underserved mm -hmm. indigent areas where women who don't have an opportunity of going into hospitals or clinics and working, they can do telemedicine out of their home and they go through a training period. So that model exists. Number two, physical safety of women in the work environment. There have been many incidents at Mayo Hospital and other hospitals across the country where angry patient families go on a rampage and attack the healthcare providers. There has to be adequate security for our health workers, be they men or women, but for women especially, because then their families don't want to send them to, they may be brilliant, but for their safety, they will not send them into a hospital, uh, you know. Third thing is, Childcare, it'll always be a woman's responsibility. All of us are professional women. All of us have families that we are raising or have raised. And as a mother, it always is the woman who is looking the majority of the care of, the, of her child. And adequate childcare as a system of adequate childcare has to be developed within the work environment across Pakistan, if you want women to have a professional life. So can Mayo Hospital and King Edward have uh, oversight, you know, uh, childcare so that women who are bringing, who are doing residencies or house jobs can bring, they drop their children and be able to see them through the day as and still retain control and not get grief from their families. Uh, those are some of the ideas that may work. I think it is very commonplace to have two residents doing the job of one during pregnancy or, you know, because we are in a re reproductive crunch. Our women have to have families in a certain period of time, which are important for training. So those are my suggestions and you know, experiences. Thank you, Nahid. Thank you very much, Nahid, for your suggestions. Nice uh, I, so yeah, uh, is uh, I think Mehreen has raised her hand, and then uh, Aisha Najib, and then I think we can have um, we can then have Nadia as well. Uh, thank you, Tabinda. Um, uh, the lovely talks. Thank you so much, Mary Farzana and Shirin. Uh, um, uh, so um, I have a, a, a suggestion because because since that we were talking about that the, now the more, more women coming in the profession and they are more going to be female doctors, I was just really thinking that it will be a really good idea to have something in the curriculum of the medical students. I mean, I give example, my, my daughter is a med student at the Brighton University and they have quite a, like a work on the gender uh, uh, equality and they have uh, they taught it for, uh, students from the year one. So which is something which was new to me because we never learned these things. And we, we, we some of us, we had like, we were very privileged because we went through our journeys with, without any issues. But I'm sure there are many women, they have the, some biases, the some obstacles and upheavals in the journeys. So perhaps it is something which will be very helpful to educate our students, the male students and the female, just because I think that is something which if the mindset starts from the beginning, that could help. And the other thing which I was just thinking that my question, I think, from the speakers is that, that how could the lies like such as men within the medicine who can help to advocate the, for the gender uh, equality. I, I'm, I'm grateful to Professor Shokat. I think that he made some good suggestions, but anything I, I would ask the speakers to uh, say something about it. Thank you. Hello, Asalaamu Alaikum. This is uh, Dr. Aisha Najib. Thank you, Kemka UK for organizing an excellent discussion. It's need of the time. I have a question from Dr. Mohammed Tafel to everyone. Um, great talk, Dr. Mary Taj, with all the facts. How can we empower female doctors to stand against the notion and expectation that they do not pursue career further after graduation and get consumed in household work? 
sorry to interrupt. Uh, someone has logged in from two devices and it's giving a very bad echo. Uh, can everyone check? You're not joining from two separate devices, please. Thank you. I think. Who would like to answer this question? Um, sorry, I put the uh, question, so I can't answer it. So. Okay, I think uh, we can ask one of the panelists to answer that. Anyone would like to volunteer? Uh, what about Nadia Jabbar? I mean, what, what do you think about it? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, the, the talks have been great. And Zafel, uh, let me just rephrase your question just to make sure I understand it properly. So you're saying what can be done so that incentivize for women that they don't leave medicine? Or are you saying what can be done to have the environment such that they're not forced to leave medicine. It is the latter, basically. Uh, that, so that they're, they're not forced to leave the yeah. yeah, so the latter, um, is the simple answer to that is education, education, and education. And that is education of our society as a whole, but mostly a education of the male members, like someone said before, to you know raise our uh, sons now that we are in that group to make sure that they grow up to respect women and treat them as equals. And that's what our religion dictates as well anyway. This is more of a cultural norm that has taken place in Pakistan where women are suppressed and subjugated. I mean, we claim to be an Islamic country, but then we practice uh, the other way around when it comes to women. So as far as that is concerned, it is just instilling that ideas amongst us, amongst our cousins, our brothers, you know. And then unfortunately, once the women graduate, it's potluck as to who they marry and what kind of a gentleman, you know, or not <laughs> ends up being. And more than that, it's the in-laws as well, because you could have a supportive husband, but then I know women who had pressure from in-laws and they've left it. And that's been the case, not only in Pakistan, but I know people here, uh, women who have, uh, you know, done medicine, who graduated from here, and, but, you know, the second generation Pakistani is growing up in England, but the families they've married into and with the pressures, they are just forced to leave, um, you know, a high ch highly charged field such as surgery. And they've chosen, um, you know, something that requires that, which is not that demanding on their time. And they've gone into general practice with extremely reduced hours because that's what suits their life. So I think that's the answer really is to uh, tell them and we can educate the people around us. But once women get married, you know, it's really uh, it's a big ball game out there. And I think that's just going to take decades for things to turn. I, I think there is a there is a very, very good point. And again, yes. um, it, it is it all stems from right from the beginnings, uh, as you mentioned. I think Professor Gondal wanted to say something about this. I think Farzana Siddiqui also wants uh, to say Farzana Siddiqui, yeah. Okay, shall I? Uh, should we go with Professor Gondal first and then uh, Farzana? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Fell, I think this is a very, very important point of a concern. After Shiri Murid's decision, uh, this was one of the main concerns during last one decade, but currently the reports are very encouraging. When myself, Tabinda and Atar, we were the student of, of the King Edward Medical College, the ratio was 20 to 80. 20% uh, were our sisters and 80% were the male. And now the ratio is totally uh, reversed. The 70% they are the female and 30% they are the male, rather less than that. But, and in the post-graduation, about uh, five years ago, because I also represent the College of Physicians in Pakistan, with us in post-graduation, the ratio of the female, that was of the 27%. And two years ago, that rose up to the 48%. And I, just, I was just calculating and asking uh, my own registration department, what is the current ratio? The last month ratio is the 54% are the female. They are opting the postgraduate medical education and they are in every specialty. Previously, they used to are the gynae, pediatrics and specialty like these. But now in general surgery, like Professor Aisha Shokat developed the new fellowship program, the breast surgery. And the 54% females, they are in the postgraduate. And we are expecting this ratio to be above 60 percent so reports they are very encouraging as far as pakistan is concerned thank you very much thank you uh, farzana we've got a couple of minutes uh, please okay. if you want to say yeah. something and then shirin has to say something okay yes yeah, so i would uh, i cannot help but talking about my mother dr hamida bano who graduated from king edward in 1946 and there was a competition with the hindu and sikh 
people there. And, you know, she was my role model. And I don't understand that all her cohort of doctors, they all worked. And therefore, this is something that we have to try to uh, unravel. That why we are now talking about that women leaving in medicine and she single-handedly worked, she got married and she was the one my as my driving force to make sure that we, we I continue to strive. So therefore, I think there is something about to educate the women and to empower them. And therefore, in order to put the blame on other, other I think the society as a whole and the religion, I don't think that that is as straightforward. Well said, Farzana. And Shirin, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, um, I, I would say that there, there has to be like a, this problem has to be approached from several angles. The first one is, and the most important I think is the family support that we have to educate the society through media and different channels that once uh, a, a graduate, you know, get at the young age gets married and has a family. So the in-laws would have uh, this uh, understanding that they can be flexible and allow and uh, be a part of that uh, thing to let uh, the person go and work, but they would be also more motivated to uh, to to compromise and, and make that happen if government has also some supportive offers like part time work and more flexible hours and uh, especially childcare for young women on site or nearby. So that will leave the in-laws, you know, the families with less uh, argument against working. So it has to be uh, from several directions that will make that happen. Yeah, thank you, Shireen. And Aisha wants to say something and then Nadia. Okay, yes, please, thank you. Uh, so uh, I have a few suggestions uh, in my talk later regarding this uh, question that was just raised. So that will be brought up later, but I must add something that uh, I mean, just to blame others is probably not right. I do understand there are a lot of circumstances which are variable for different people. But yes, I think we need to talk about uh, work-life balance in our med schools. Medical counselors need to play a role since, uh, so uh, we all are women. We cannot deny it. How, why should we deny it? We are going to be raising families. There are certain responsibilities that are there, they are required from a woman and you need to be proud of those responsibilities. So work is another one and the family life and everything that is related to it is your responsibilities. So we need to be uh, ready for that. And we need to have these medical counselors. We need to have role models. Like, I mean, there are so many like you at the in this forum right now who need to be mentors to these um, new uh, women out there who are seeking uh, uh, to become professionals. So we can have our own examples. We all have our families, we have responsibilities and we've done all that. So um, I don't really sit here and blame all these men that they, they don't let them work, they don't let them do this. Yes, we need to educate the society as well because since, uh, a lot of the seats are occupied by these female students, so the society needs to come forward and they need to know that they have to be supportive and the society includes the parents of these women and the parent in-laws of the women also. We're talking of our own culture here because here we have more of a huge extended family that makes a lot of decisions for our own selves. So yes, uh, the media mm, and the um, health workers, we need to take in the society and uh, um, uh, probably educate them. So the rest, I think I'll discuss in my talk. Thank, Thank you for you. the time. Thank you, Aisha. I'll just take a quick 10 seconds and then I can um, ask Nadia to make her comment uh, because we only have one minute left. So uh, we, um, I work with Peninsula Medical School and uh, we've got this small session facilitator. So we facilitate about eight students uh, from third year medicine. And I think that's, a, uh, that's just a one-to-one -one with them and a small group and they talk about anything that they want to talk about and you kind of their informal mentor, any problems that they're having. So perhaps starting that because um, um, Aisha and uh, Professor Gondal are in that position that they can start such um, little groups and things like that where they can be like informal and formal mentorship. So I think mentorship concept has to come in in Pakistan for us to carry on this as, as guides and, and, and things like that. So we'll quickly over to Nadia, please. 
Thank you. I was just going to say to take on the part of, uh, you know, flexible working for women. I think uh, that's a great thing because you can do best of both the worlds. And yes, we have our responsibilities and careers and we want to do both. So I was the, um, you know, the uh, representative for less than full time trainees for the Mersey Deanery. And I fully advocated that because it is just such a big help. And throughout half of my training, I uh, went flexible and I'm still working as a flexible consultant. So my profession is such as a field of radiology that I can work from home, which is great. But the flexible working hours and the flexible rota and job sharing, I think, is a great way forward, both here in the West and definitely something we need to look into Pakistan, because that is the way forward that is going to help more women feel at peace and at ease while working. And, you know, like you said, Aisha, just to be women, you know, why should we shy away from that, that we have other responsibilities, but we want to achieve other things as well. Thank you very much, Nadia. And it's time for um, Dr. Athar Saeed, who's uh, my uh, class fellow from back in the day. And also we did house jobs together. Um, And he's, uh, he has a citation and um, presentation for Shirin Munir. Athar? Uh, Yes, thank you very much, uh, Sabinda. It is my privilege and honor to read this citation so that we can grant Akanka UK Excellence in Human Rights Award to Shirin Munir. Uh, Shirin uh, was born and brought up in Lahore. Uh, her father, Sayyid Munir Hussain, was a professor of law at the Punjab University. Uh, she went to the Cathedral School in Lahore and to the Lahore College for Women, now a university. Um, as we know uh, that uh, she moved the Lahore High Court in 1986 uh, to abolish the restrictive quota on women's admission to medical colleges of Punjab. Uh, She eventually won this court case in the Supreme Court. Uh, This brought about a transformative change in the demographics of medical education and was a huge step forward in equal rights for women. And actually, many Congolian women, doctors who are here today, owe their careers to this landmark legal victory. And for this, uh, we are privileged to confer the Kampa UK Human Rights Award to Shirin. Uh, Shirin actually did not pursue medicine uh, because of the delay in her court battle. Uh, She went into veterinary medicine and won a top academic honors in her studies. Uh, She was offered a scholarship to the University of Minnesota and built a career as a research virologist. Uh, She is currently working as staff scientist at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases with a focus on respiratory viruses including intranasal vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. I congratulate uh, Shirin on winning uh, this prestigious award. Thank you. There there are loads of virtual claps uh, for you, Shirin. (laughs) Thank you, everyone. And uh, especially thank you, KEMC Association UK, for inviting me to this uh, special occasion and for this honor and recognition. Thank you, everyone. So um, thank you very much. And we just discovered that Shirin and I also went to cathedral school. So we must have been there sometime at at, at the same time, really. (laughs) Uh, So uh, over to the next session. uh, And uh, thank you very much, uh, the uh, participants, the speakers, and the panelists. It was a a great discussion full of uh, heart and soul, I would say. Um, from such trailblazers in their professions. And, you know, I feel extremely honored to be in that position that I was able to facilitate this, um, this, this session. And thank you to Farzana, to Mary, to Shirin, uh, to Nadia, to Aisha, and uh, to um, all the other parts of Mehreen, of course. Um, and I had some useful discussions with Mehreen to sort this out. So Mehreen, thank you very much. Um, and uh, over to the second session, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think excellent discussion. So my name is Asif Khan. I'm one of the intervention cardiologists. With all these uh, discussion, I can proudly say that without the support of my wife, Fatma Asif, who is, she is a Chemcolian, I would not have achieved cardiology career with all her sacrifice in the last, you know, last 10, 15 years. And mashallah, now she's uh, nearly qualified full GP with two kids, you know, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a great honor. So, um, so the next uh, section two we have is more for opportunities for women uh, and success stories. So uh, I would like to invite uh, for this chairing the session, again, our academic uh, you know, executives, uh, one of them is 
uh, Dr. Atar Said, who is a consultant gastroenterologist in UK, and Professor Saira Avzal, who is professor of community medicine, and both are very, very strong academic pillars for King Edward Medical University. So please welcome, and they will introduce the rest of the panel. In terms of quick housekeeping rules remains the same. You can put your questions in the chat section, and we will try to answer them in the end. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Asif. Um, I have the honor of introducing my co-chair, Saira Afsal, the professor in community medicine at the King Edward Medical University. I had the privilege of working with her on, uh, on the annals of uh, King Edward Medical University over the past one or two years uh, to bring out specialists on uh, university healthcare. And also, how to know that uh, she has actually revolutionized the curriculum the way community medicine is taught uh, at KE uh, compared to our days, uh, so that uh, there are lots of opportunities for young students to learn about research, research methodology, actually do research projects and understand statistics and uh, also to be able to critically analyze and understand journal articles. So uh, Saira is my co-chair and we have a star-studded panel of speakers and also uh, discussants. Um, our first uh, our speaker is uh, Aisha Sakib, who is a senior trainee in diabetes and endocrinology in Guys and St. Thomas's. She also um, has played a very significant leadership role in the Royal College of Physicians. Um, and we will introduce the panelists and speaker as we go on. Uh, but let me make an announcement. Um, at the outset, after we conclude this uh, session, which will be just after eight o'clock, there will be a bonus five minutes uh, of extra time for people who want to stay. That is a surprise known only to me and very few others. So those who want to hang on for that pleasant surprise bonus five minutes are welcome. Um, it is also my privilege to introduce um, and welcome Dr. Pastor Sultan, who is the uh, special assistant to the Prime Minister in Health, and also um, uh, who is the Health Minister. In Health. So we'll start uh, with uh, Aisha. Aisha, your talk: Women as Medical Leaders. Aisha, unmute. Aisha, we cannot hear you. But I think sure uh, we can un try to unmute her again. I think she's sharing the slide, but I we can't hear her at the moment. Can we, can you try to unshare and try to rejoin the meeting and then we can, and if, uh, um, if uh, we can maybe take this talk next as a second and if Afshan is ready, then we can get her next Can you time. hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Hello. Oh. We can hear you. You can't hear us. Uh, go ahead. We, we can hear you, Aisha. Can you hear me now? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'll carry on then. Wonderful. Sorry for that. Um, I don't know what happened. Um, I'll start the slide share. Okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Atta Said. Um, I'm feeling really privileged to be here today. It's an exciting opportunity. And um, I graduated from King Edward in 2010. And I never worked in Pakistan. And I came straight to UK. So I'm just going to present my experience of working as a doctor in um, the NHS. It's a challenge moving to another country, learning another culture. NHS is a culture of its own. So I did went into straight away went into the UK Foundation program, which is your house officer, senior house officer job, and then I went into co-medical training. And in co-medical training in the UK, it's a two-hour long 
pro two year long program used to be a two year long program and you're required to do all your mrcps during this time and only when you do it you are able to apply for a national training number in a specialist training program and i was very lucky to get into a south london number and i have worked in five hospitals since because when you're training in the uk you move hospital almost every year i've worked with amazing work colleagues saw thousands of patients and have had amazing supervisors during this time who have always enabled me to and encouraged me to achieve various things and obviously i've got two children as well so i'm a very busy mom when i'm at home um so life is a junior doctor in the uk it's very busy you have a long training program um but it's great fun the learning curve is extremely steep but I think a lot of panelists um, discussed this earlier as well. The job is made easy by the by the NHS as an organization. You have options to take time out of training. You can work less than full time. There's opportunity to take maternity leave, and obviously you get statutory maternity pay for six months out of the six of the whole year of maternity leave that you wish to take. There's opportunity to do research and get involved in quality improvement or leadership work. And then you have training versus the non-training pathways as well. So not everyone has to go into training. You can do other things and still get a Caesar outcome to be able to work as an associate specialist later on, not, not a consultant. And there are academic pathways as well if you want to go into lectureship and professorship. So I think there's a lot of variety. There's a mix and match. You can always choose whatever fancies you. Um, the, the various leadership programs that are available within NHS, um, the first one is by the Royal College of Physicians. It's called the Chief Registrar Role. It's for higher specialist trainees. Then we have the National Medical Director Fellowships, where as a junior doctor, you're attached to a medical director. Uh, there's Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management Fellowships. Um, we have the Care Quality Commission Fellowships. Care Quality Commission is like an, a regulatory body which visits various hospitals and tries and see if they are, if they are up to scratch or um, up to the right standards. More recently, the UK Foundation Program has started a leadership fellowship program for foundation doctors, basically who have just come out of training. And then we have medical education fellowships as well. So there's a lot to choose from if you're interested in leadership and QI, development as a doctor. And I think every doctor has to have some leadership traits to be able to work properly and raise a voice for their patients. What I did was the Royal College of Physicians Chief Registrar role. This was started in 2016. It's a one year long post and you do clinical work along with it, but for 50% or 60% of the time, you get dedicated days of clinical work to focus properly on managerial Hospital management, leadership, quality improvement, whatever you wish to do in that time is your time. You're not bound to respond back to anyone. You just do whatever you wish to do. But you are based in NHS Trust and you have to be above SD4 level, which is towards the end of our training as a junior doctor before you become a consultant. And when you're working in the NHS, obviously, you have to have a role in service development and service delivery and general medicine is also part of our training. And we do general medical on calls as part of certain specialty training. Um, the role can be done within the training program and outside the training program and there are different nitty gritties to it. And I'm more than happy to explain this later on if any of the audience are interested in applying for it, if they're based in the UK. You are given leadership coaching by the Royal College of Physicians team and you're supported from your local mentors, who is usually a medical director or a clinical director. So very senior physicians with lots of wisdom. Um, so obviously for me as a trainee doctor, it was a new thing because we're only used to clinical work. We're used to doing our ward rounds, doing our clinics, do the admin associated with it. And then if you're doing it as part of your training, you need to do some workplace-based assessments because you need to be able to go to your annual review of competencies progress with some evidence every year to say you have been working hard and you're a good doctor and you're safe and you haven't killed anyone um, to be able to pass on and get stay keep your national training number and move to the next year. But when I did this role, a new avenue opened up for me. I had three days a week where I could just focus on management. So the first three months of my role, it was all about meeting the chief executive, meeting the medical director, meeting teams from NHSI, NHSE, NHS Digital. You can meet so many people. It opens up a lot of windows of opportunities for you. You create collaborations and then you kick off with your own QI work. And once you start establishing your own domain and you develop your own brand within the organization, you then have to be responsible for project management of your work. So the key work that I did last year, which was obviously deeply affected by COVID, the first was about flattening hierarchies, because obviously when people are sitting in the executive offices and then their junior doctors are working on the ward, you have to have some form of collaboration. There should be some communication between the two of them. And I felt I was a very important bridge um, between these two groups of uh, people. And then this led to me working on systems and processes. So I did a lot of work around hospital at night. How do we work out of hours and how do we keep our patients safe? 
Um, and how do we exchange and deliver information um, between um, medical teams? And another important thing which I worked on was promoting well-being, because I think as doctors, we are really bad. We glamorize hard work. We completely ignore ourselves. And we think it's good to show that actually I'm working so hard and I'm, I'm the one who is running this place. But actually, it's sometimes good to just take a break, sit back and look at the bigger picture and focus on your own self as well. So we did some work on that with other um, junior doctors. Um, and medical education is something very close to my heart. In this role, you could do all of that. And then obviously more than 50% of the doctors who came to the UK last year and registered with the GMC were actually from um, ethnic minorities. So that's a large portion of numbers. So in your NHS hospitals, you will have doctors who have not trained in the UK, not trained in the NHS and has come from abroad. So I think I felt that me being an IMG, I have a major role. This is a cause close to my heart and I should do some work about it. So I used my time to spend some time with the IMGs and we came up with the draft induction program. I thought QI, that's like up my street. I'm going to nail it. Last I'll one minute, please. Thank sale, you. Um, and I will do it. But actually, it's not a smooth ride. You've run into problems. There are troubles. Um, you will face difficulties. But as long as your vision is clear, you can move on to that. I think I am taking a lot of time. So I will just move to the last slide of my reflections and my role as a leader. Um, I think it's possible to transcend hierarchies. It's difficult, but it's not impossible but you have to be respectful of others. And you don't have to be a consultant or someone in a senior leadership role to be able to drive a change. You can do it even as a house officer, as an SHO, as long as you're nice, kind, polite, and you have a clear vision and you define your vision to your seniors, mentors, and it's really good to form allies with them and identify the key stakeholders and work as a team. And don't think with one day's or one week's worth of effort, you will be able to change an organization's culture. culture changing culture takes time. You have to be patient. You have to be able to embed and sustain the change. And what I learned, I think we so need to enable each other. We need to enable not only women, but also men, people from other cultures, people from other countries. We need to encourage ideas. We cannot say you are just a junior doctor or you have just come out of training. What can you tell me? We need to encourage new ideas and we need to provide fair access of opportunities for all, um, no matter who they are and just be respectful to everyone. We need to support everyone from all backgrounds and we need to work on removing our own internal biases, which I think sometimes we don't realize. We think we are being subjected to, uh, we feel ourselves that we are the victim. Oh, I'm a woman or I'm working so hard. I'm doing all the housework and then I'm going to work. Actually, sometimes it's just good to sit back and see what the other person is going through and um, take it from there. Um, and this is the last slide. Sorry, I promise Asifai, it's the last slide. So basically, when you see from outside and you see someone, oh my God, they're so successful, they're so amazing, um, uh, they must have done something or they are very lucky to be there. But actually what you do not see is the struggles they have went through, the amount of times you have faced failure and you then get on and you carry on. Um, I think it's just really only once you have been through the situation yourself, you realize the other person has been through a lot before being at the pinnacle of their career where we tend to realize and see them. So there's hope for all of us. We all have a chance and um, the future is bright and we need to be positive. And I just wanted to encourage everyone and um, get out and do it. We are women, I've got two children. I've got, I've seen difficult family, personal circumstances. Um, we all have been through a lot, um, but I think it's good to just find a fine balance and try and manage, we can do that. Thank you very much, everyone. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Aisha. Wonderful talk. And uh, we have high hopes from you. You are a future leader, not only of the British Pakistanis, but also the community in the UK, inshallah. So I am reminded of a, a couplet by Ismail Meriti. He wrote that Larki wo jo ladkiyo mein khele, na ke ladko mein ja ke dand pele. So that reflects our conservative attitude towards. Uh, you know, girls and their activities, including their studies and their sports and their physical activities. Uh, but I think the society dynamics change over time, and they have, uh, as uh, is typified by people like Aisha. Uh, it is also um, now my privilege uh, to invite uh, Dr. Professor Afsha Hamid, who is joining us from the University of California, Irvine. Uh, she's a professor of obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, she will start her talk in a minute, and I also welcome once again uh, Faisal Sultan and Madam Yasmin Rashid who have joined us in spite of their uh, very busy schedule of fighting the current pandemic. So over to uh, Professor Afshah Hamid. 
Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I would like to thank the, um, the leadership and I'm so impressed by what everyone has done so far. So in the next 10 minutes, um, I'm just gonna go through my journey and I wanted to share what it takes. Uh, I think in a nutshell, I really like that iceberg slide. Uh, we are looking at the tip of the iceberg for all of us here uh, who are, uh, who are um, at uh, good places in their professional lives. And I think the other important thing is behind every successful woman is a man. And, and usually that's your husband that, that helps you through get to where you are. So this is where you are when you graduate. Uh, the life is ahead of you. You are at the top of the world. You think you're gonna conquer everything. It's gonna be super easy, you are a doctor. But there's a, there's a rough road ahead. And, and, and at some point you just pause and think and you see what you really want to do. And like mentioned earlier, I think uh, the statistics that we have from, especially from Pakistan in general for women, you know, you are a doctor and you have your career and now you have to, you know, you also have to get married, you have to have children, you have to have your family as well. Um, back when, 30 years ago, when I graduated from uh, King Edward Medical College, I was at that time where I think on merit, we were like 12 women and the rest of the class of 200 were men. Um, and, and I can tell you out of those, my own friends, uh, half of them, they never practiced. They, they, they just left medicine uh, for family reasons. And the other half, they struggled through and had their careers. And those are the big decisions that we all have to make. And you, all of you, you are here. I'm so proud of women who are here, who are powerful, who are empowered, who are empowering others. That's where we need to go. That's where we need to encourage our younger um, colleagues. So, um, you know, um, coming to America uh, and then, of course, I, it's a given. You have to do your entrance test. You have to go through your residency interviews. You decide what residency you want to be. And, and then you graduate from your residency. And then is whether you go into private practice or you go into academics. To me, it was a no-brainer. I think even to this date, I can remember the lectures that I got from the professors at uh, KE uh, and the patients that I saw and, and the impact that I've had through the years of the education that I got in Pakistan. So it was really important. I wanted to be in academics. It's not a question at all. Now, the bigger problem was at the time when I started, um, I came, I actually, um, after graduation came to, um, got married, came here, and I was told you can't really do much because it's really difficult to get into um, a residency. Fortunately, I went through, um, got into cardiology, wanted to do, uh, OBGYN, high risk OB, and that's how we, I got to where I am. All through life, all through the time, it was a work-life balance, whether it was through residency or it was through um, the career in academics. And as we know, start off as assistant, associate, professor, and there are various steps that you go through and you get to where you are. And there are different series. I, I chose the clinical health series uh, because I wanted to do both research and clinical and I couldn't give up um, seeing patients myself. So that was really important to me. So then I think uh, once you are in academics, um, especially when you start out as a junior assistant professor, the four areas in the US uh, that takes you to the next step or where you're gonna be is of course your teaching abilities, your research, your professional recognition and the university service. So again, not only you're balancing your home life and your personal life, but you also have many, many challenges uh, being in academics and achieving all of those four goals for you to progress through the ranks from assistant to associate and then become a professor. In my own personal life, uh, what I have, 
I always share with my students here in, um, you know, I did uh, internal medicine residency and then I went, um, did cardiology fellowship. I was a cardiology fellow at University of Southern California when um, we used to go to uh, this uh, OB clinic because at the time there were a lot of pregnant women with cardiac disease. They were uh, mitral stenosis patients coming from Mexico and they were, um, there was a great need. And I somehow got connected with that. I said, you know, I want to have, I want to be on the other side. I want to do OBGYN. And part of it has to do with my own mother who is now retired, of course, but she went back when in 1950s to England to um, do postgraduate in uh, OBGYN, I was practicing and that was her thing. You know, you, you know, uh, she, was so much in love with OBGYN. It was ingrained in my mind. And then I saw this connection between cardiac disease and pregnancy. So anyway, so I did that. And I'm very fortunate to be on part of the, um, at the national level here in, in America to be at the maternal mor mortality review committees. We are doing a lot of work to improve healthcare uh, for women in, uh, in the US. Um, last, last two minutes, please. Thank you. And then uh, I think the biggest, biggest thing what I, uh, what I have learned through the years is not only, you know, going through the ranks, you get into what you want to be, no matter where you are. I'm sure each one of you have been in this situation where you have your responsibility. And for me, it was additional because as I started my um, um, fellowship in maternal fetal medicine, we just had triplet girls. So we had triplets. I'm starting my assistant professor at University of California, Irvine, and the whole path beyond. Um, so again, I think, uh, I think there is no barrier to women if they want to do things. Uh, you need to have the support, you need to have the conviction, the hard work um, to get to where you need to be. And never ever think, that any of your training, any of the thing that you're doing is gonna go waste. Uh, it's all gonna be, eventually, it's gonna all fall into place and you're gonna be where you want to be. And I'm very fortunate again um, to be um, chairing the cardiovascular disease prevention in pregnancy in the whole country here in the US. Uh, we are just releasing American College of OBGYN. I'm working with them. We just put out a toolkit um, uh, for uh, prevention and for recognition of um, signs for maternal morbidity and mortality. And I was very fortunate to go to, um, just before COVID, to back to KE and talk about um, the maternal mortality uh, in Pakistan. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done at the maternal child level. Uh, the biggest accomplishment after this is my three daughters. We have 16-year-olds um, who are now high schoolers. I hope that they um, keep this tradition of being uh, committed in their, in their future as well. With that, I'm just going to stop there. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be amongst highly accomplished group of women. Thank you. Thank you, Afshar. What a wonderful personal journey and what a wonderful academic achievement. Very well done. So I'm reminded of uh, some poetry again. Uh, Iqbal wrote that uh, about women that Makale mate falatu nalik saki lekin isi ke shole se tuta sharare aflatu. So what he was saying was that the woman can't write the dialogues of Plato. They can give birth to people like they do. Uh, but I think the uh, uh, the world has changed. The aspects of the world have changed, hopefully in diaspora as well as in Pakistan. And I think people like Afshan uh, and others are bringing uh, this new world uh, into being, just like she brought into uh, this world her accomplished triplex. So um, thank you very much, Afsha. Um So it is my... Uh, um, honor and privilege now to introduce Professor Aisha Shokat, who is a professor of surgery at the King Edward Medical University. Uh, she will talk about the rise of women medical graduates. Aisha Shokat. 
Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, you can. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so this is Pakistan's birthday today. So first of all, I'd like to wish Pakistan a very happy birthday. So, and then my talk for today is the rise of women medical graduates, which is a Pakistani perspective. Now, first of all, I would mention um, here Newton, Newton's third law of motion, which says that to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So with Shireen Munir's case, uh, where she won a level playing field for the women, and there was, uh, and the women really played well. So the current situation um, is, now this is the class of King Edward of today. So here, as we all sit here, um, uh, those are, I mean, the past graduates, we can all uh, remember that we used to be the ones sitting in the first two rays and rows and the boys were all um, at the back rows. And now here the situation is reversed you can see the boys in the first two rows and now there is this majority of the women out there. So this is the current class of King Edward. Uh, Professor Gondal is taking a lecture here. And uh, then if we look at, uh, and these girls, they do brilliantly. They uh, get these, uh, uh, the positions, the all professionals and they get these gold medals, etc. They get I mean, they actually perform brilliantly throughout. But then what happens once they graduate? So what next? Uh, there is a, there's a tremendous uh, fallout. Um, the government uh, has introduced central induction policy for uh, postgraduate training uh, induction. And I just got a recent data for this year, and this was 638 new doctors were inducted for this postgraduate training program. And here, what we see is that now there are 60% boys who got inducted into the training program and 40% of the girls. So there is a, now a reverse situation. Once they got into the med school, it was a reverse. And now once they're entering into these training programs, it's a shift again. Now I'll quote a study uh, carried out in Karachi on the final year uh, female medical students. And uh, according uh, to this uh, study, uh, uh, they made a survey about their choice and future plans after graduation. And what we see here is that most of the students say, well, do you want to uh, continue with your um, like the training programs? Yes. So do you want to acquire postgraduate qualifications? Yes. So the desire is there. Yeah, just a minute, it's like, uh, yeah. So the desire is there, but then what happens? So the study concludes that yes, they did want to go ahead with the uh, postgraduate medical education and the concept that is raised by the media and the society that they are becoming uh, doctors just to become those trophy wives, it's not right. So then the big question arises, how and where does the hindrance, hindrance arise? which is stopping these females to carry out their goals and make them more practical. Now, uh, I'll quote another uh, data that has been shared by uh, Vajahat uh, Bukhari. And according to uh, Vajahat Bukhari, 232,358 uh, 232, doctors were registered with the uh, Pakistan Medical uh, Council. And out of them, there were 110,000 were female doctors. Now again, uh, among these 110,000 uh, uh, female doctors, only 15,000 were the one which were registered as medical specialists. So there was again a 60% dropout from this total that was registered with the Pakistan Medical and Dental Council. So in a population, um, uh, like us, where there's like a huge, uh, um, I mean, a population explosion out there, and we do need two doctors per 1,000 people. And so if we consider the number of doctors that have moved out because of the various social reasons and pursuance of the higher medical education, so they are there, and those who are left out in the country, and even if they're not practicing, so there is going to be a huge dearth for the medical specialists available. Uh, I had a, my own uh, uh, study done a few years back, and this was actually related to the selection of speciality for the post-graduation um, by the doctors. And, this, and I realized that there was a need for career counselor because the females were practically getting concentrated in uh, fields like ops and gynae, pediatrics, 
dermatology, pathology. Uh, so this is just like an overview of my own uh, study. So there were very few in, you know, almost zero in urology and just one in ophthalmology, um, et cetera, orthopedics, almost zero. So I, I realized that there was going to be uh, those who are um, uh, specializing, even these women, uh, they are just being concentrated in very particular fields. And despite of uh, this, the speciality selection that they had done, um, when I just uh, surveyed about the level of satisfaction, there was a huge chunk. They were still mm, not satisfied with what they have chosen. And there's this, the red block that you see here is like a wide majority again, but just moderately satisfied with what they have chosen. The government of Punjab, uh, uh, has come up uh, with a lot of incentives for women, and I must appreciate them for this effort. Uh, like in the Public Service Commission, even recently for interviews uh, for selections of uh, senior registrar surgery on assistant professor of surgery, etc. And same goes for other fields like medicine and all. Uh, there was open merit in which uh, the women were competing along with the men. And since um, they do have higher uh, merit because of their increased uh, earned marks, so they have a better probability of entering into these uh, uh, seats. And along with that, they, there was even a women quota. So there is, uh, they definitely made sure that there was more opportunity provided to the women medical graduates. So what the government uh, can do, they are doing it. So what are the issues that we need to tackle and how can we bridge the gap? So here are a few suggestions. First of all, as far as the issues are concerned, as from my own uh, practical experience in this, um, you know, uh, uh, my, my uh, uh, practical life, there is a lack of knowledge of the scope and demand that comes with various fields. So there's a lot of notions and myths that are in people's minds about the number of working hours. And uh, then there's a fear that, you know, if they opt for a certain field, there may not be other females around. So, and there is a fear of not thriving in male dominant fields like general surgery, orthopedics, etc., which is really at I don't think it's true. I'll quote my own example. When I joined King Edward Medical University as professor, I was uh, appointed here in 2014. I was given an unprecedented welcome. Professor Gondu was the head of the Department of Surgery at that time. And uh, when I joined that place at that time, then I realized, and I was told actually, that in 150 years of history, of King Edward Medical College, there was, uh, I was probably the first uh, female uh, professor of surgery that was appointed there. So, and I, and throughout my working um, years over there, I really never had a problem, um, you know, um, in which I was discriminated or uh, there was um, anything like that that I can ever quote. But we need to share this with other um, uh, women. And that's why I said that we need to mentor our uh, junior graduates uh, to just uh, um, negate these myths. Last so two anyway, minutes, there is a notion that there's difficulty in maintaining a work-life balance. So the areas of improvement that we need to uh, actually talk to these uh, uh, young graduates about time management. We are women, we have our responsibilities, we, are, we have our homes, families, and yet we are going to be having our careers. So we need to be the one who need to uh, manage this time. So we have role models like so many of this in, on this forum today, uh, who can be mentors to these women. And then we must, uh, I mean, there's a very important role of the medical counselors. So uh, we need to uh, use public health platforms and social media uh, actually to educate the society that these women graduates, the women medical graduates are needed in the society. We cannot have these seats wasted and they're important. There's a very important role that they need to play in the society. We need to educate parents. We need to educate the in-laws to be a supportive system. So each one, teach one again, that I'm repeatedly saying that we need to mentor these women. Uh, introduce flexi hours during the postgraduate training programs. Now, this is something that is not present in our country. And I think Professor Gondal, he's uh, with the CPSP and other CPSP members. Um, 
we need to consider this aspect because uh, if a four year training program there's all or none law you are in it or you're not in it so they have i mean if we introduce these flexi hours there would be more women that can take up post graduate uh, post graduate studies and introduce flexi hours in the work environment uh, as well because again all or none law you do it or you don't do it so that is how we lose on a lot of uh, uh, women who would have uh, been in the field if uh, this support system was available we talk of these day care centers the government has a uh, Mm, uh, I mean, they made sure that the government, these daycare centers are there, but we also need to actually make sure that these daycare centers are well equipped so that the uh, women can uh, feel comfortable by leaving their kids in these um, daycare centers. There are many, many women like uh, Madam Yasmin Rashid who've paved the road, uh, ro paved the road uh, uh, already for us. Madam Yasmin, I've seen her um, myself. I'm a witness uh, that... Uh, she uh, got married during her, uh, I think, med school. She had raised a family. She's done wonderfully in her career. And even now, with her recent illness, she has fought it so bravely that she is a role model for each one of us. Um, and she's actually been the frontline worker despite her own illness in this uh, COVID situation. So there are so many others who can be presented as role models to these women graduates. So we can't really blame uh, the society all the time. Uh, and finally, I would conclude with this uh, slide, which is one of my favorites. Here, there's a female head of the surgery along with this female, three uh, general surgical residents, even the uh, the anesthetist here is a female and I've just covered the patient who also happened to be a female. So this slide is uh, purely a women empowerment slide and one of my favorite ones. So thank you. And I'm sorry if I've taken uh, more of the time. Well, thank you very much, Aisha. Uh, another first, uh, a historic first in the history of Tengar Medical University, the first surgical professor was with us. Um, so I think we now enter into the panel discussion. I will ask uh, Professor Saira Afsal to introduce the remaining members of the panel, apart from the three speakers that we've just heard. And in addition, I think we will also want to ask questions to Professor Yasmin Rashid and Professor Sultan. Uh, so over to Saira. Thank you very much, Dr. Athar. It is wonderful and uh, really inspirational how the different ladies they have put their effort to come to this point, and now they are presenting their success stories. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Nahi Usmani. I know she needs no introduction. Uh, she is the graduate of 1980, professor of pediatrics hematology, oncology for, in the University of Massachusetts. She is the volunteer consultant in Charitable Trust Telemedicine United Kingdom from 2001 to present the largest international humanitarian telemedicine project. She has worked in various leadership roles and she has proved herself in organizations like Kamkana and APNA. Our next panelist is Dr. Abira Abbas and I'm lucky enough that uh, Dr. Abira is my class fellow. Assalamualaikum. She, uh, she is a graduate of 2001 and a consultant on coplastic breast surgeon in Manchester. And she has a very good uh, skills. She was a third panel is Dr. Farhat Shiri. Dr. Farhat Shiri is the consultant rheumatologist in Missouri. And these are our panelists. Now I would request Dr. Adhar, if you have any questions, please start uh, the questions from the panelists. Uh, thank you, Saira. So I think in the interest of time and efficiency, we will ask a question one by one to the panelists. If you have any particularly uh, eager or burning questions, please put them in the chat section and try to see if they can be asked as well. So my question is uh, to Nahid Usmani. Uh, you were one of the pioneers in Pakistan when Chokot Sanam started as well. So um, can you just uh, recount your experience, your pioneering work in Chokot Sanam? Uh, I think many people would be interested to know. 
So, Any question, I guess. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Ether. And thank you for the kind words, Saira. You're always the kindest person I have encountered. Uh, you know, God gives you opportunities. And my opportunity was Shrakat Khanam Cancer Hospital. It was the mountain I climbed. All the other work that I've done, all my professional achievements matter not at all compared to how I was able to serve Pakistan uh, when I was working at Shrakat Khanam. Uh, one of the key things that I think has been, uh, you know, uh, part of my work ethics uh, is the bringing up that I had. I was all, we never recognized the gender roles in our family. You know, my brothers and I were given equal responsibilities as to what we had to do for home. Our, uh, expectations, our academic expectations were very similar. So all my life when I've worked, it has not mattered whether I was a, I never think that I'm a woman and this is what a woman should do. You do your job that you are trained for and you do the best. In the five, six year, five years, almost five years I was in Lahore, I never faced gender discrimination. At Shaukat Khanam, it was not about me leading pediatrics uh, and pediatrics being less relevant than adult medicine because it was led by a woman. Actually, both the oncologists at Shaukat Khanam in the beginning were women. Dr. Fazia Rana and myself, uh, we were leading pediatric oncology and oncology. So the oncological aspect of a cancer hospital was led by women. I did extensive uh, outreach to Sheikh Zayed Hospital, to uh, Jinnah Hospital, to Mayo Hospital, to Children's Hospital, uh, everywhere to make and in more making sure that children were getting equal access to oncology treatments wherever they were and educate, doing educational updates of uh, uh, pediatricians across Lahore, never encountered any issues based on my gender. So I think a lesson that we have to realize is that we have to change the perception women have about themselves. We have to go beyond our gender assignment Yes, I kept my children with me, I, you know, that responsibility. I mean, I don't, I'm a very passionate mother. Nobody can take, uh, you know, my children away from me. I will not delegate their care to anybody else but myself. Uh, but that doesn't take away my ability to contribute professionally. I think that is the biggest thing. Luckily, I, was, I had a very supportive husband who let me decide what I wanted, who treated me like an equal, who treated my career as as important as his own career, never interfered. And partly it could be because he was not in medicine. He had no idea what the drivers were and I could put in any hours <laughs> I needed to, to do my work. Uh, yes, there is man's explaining that you have to go through, there is some discrimination that you work through, be it in US, be it in UK or in Pakistan, that is not any different. I think women just have to be more assertive and have more self-respect and confidence and be able to uh, do what their dreams are. I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, autonomy and self-esteem. Okay, thank you, uh, Rahid. Very insightful. Uh, so over to Saira to ask the next, next question. Uh, my question is from Dr. Aisha Saqib. Are there lessons learned in women's career progression which can be applied to Pakistan as you have uh, uh, tell us many things about your own uh, story and how you have progressed in your career? So how do you see that these lessons can be applied to the people in Pakistan because you have been here and you have been educated here? Um, thank you, uh, Professor Sairavzal. Thank you for asking me this question. 
Um, I think it's, it's, I think about this sometimes because I really want to give back what I got from Pakistan and from King Edward. And I think, what can I do? And I think there's so much opportunity we have in medical school, medical education, postgraduate medical education, the way we can design and structure things. We can inculcate leadership training from very early on. We can inculcate training in audit and quality improvement projects from very early on in our training because sometimes it can get really boring to just be doing clinical work day in, day out. You feel like you're a monkey. You're just going to work, doing shifts and coming back home. If we make the jobs exciting, make them part leadership, part QI training, part medical education, part clinical, people might find it more exciting and they might want to stay on at work for longer. This, These are some ideas which come in my mind. And I don't know what other things I um, think about this as well, but I'm um, just... Okay, this is wonderful. Now, my next question is from Dr. Afsha Hamid. Are the Pakistani doctors adequately presented in academia in US? And what are the challenges that they face in academia in the United States? Thank you. Um, and that's a very important question. No matter where you are in this whole wide world, there is going to be some degree of discrimination among, uh, for women, uh, even though we may think I think once you get to the top, once you get to a level where you are the only one who can fix things, yes, there's no discrimination, but on your way up, gosh, there is a lot. Now, having said that, I have to say that Pakistani women, particularly physicians, they are the best. They are so resilient. I cannot believe. Uh, I'm so proud of Pakistani women who are doctors who are here in the US or elsewhere. In fact, um, a couple of years ago, there was this a very small piece uh, on news that, that they wanted two cardiologists to say something. And I was amazed. It was just me. And there was another cardiologist who was Pakistani woman out of all the California. So I was so proud. I, was, I said, what are the chances of having two Pakistani women cardiologists on ABC channel? So it's amazing. I think things that you can do. Having said that, I think the most important piece of this is your husband and the careers. I think if you get married, like I did to a husband who's well-established, who, who does not have to struggle with me, you are fine. I think you can, you can do your thing. The, the, the uh, phys Pakistani physicians in US that I've seen who have not been able to do anything are the ones who came, both of them needed to be in the residency, both of them, you know, they had children then, then, then you prioritize, right? So most of the ones who ended up not doing anything are the ones uh, whose husbands were struggling at the same time and they had young kids. And then it was just 10 years later and you're too far out and you cannot go back. So uh, again, I think um, most of the physicians that I see and actually who, um, have worked hard to get where they are. Either their husbands are not physicians or they were a little bit more established when they got married. That's my take on it. Quite the story of uh, courage and determination among Pakistani physicians abroad. Uh, can I ask next two questions to uh, uh, Aisha Shokat and Bilpi Shabir respectively? Uh, Aisha, you first. Uh, you've, uh, we've talked uh, briefly about the initiatives for flexible working. Um, uh, Professor Mahmood Shokat uh, talked about it a little bit as well. So can you elaborate a little bit? How do you uh, see the scene evolving in Pakistan so that the predominantly female work, medical workforce uh, does have opportunities for career progression and staying in the profession in the future? Aisha Shokat. Is that for you? Is that for me? Yeah, uh, this is like a suggestion that I have because uh, over here, like the working hours that we have, as I said, that's all or none law. If, you, if you're into a training program or even or a job, so you do it or you don't do it. But in the West, there are uh, options uh, for everyone, irrespective of whether it's a male or a female, that you have options of your uh, flexible hours. You can probably, and your pay or salary is going to be according to the hours that you have worked so it could be like two days in a week or it could be three days in a week so i think um, there are so many uh, uh like posts available like medical officers like the casualty medical officers as general practitioners as uh, emergency medical officers etc uh, uh that uh, these um, women or even boys uh, who probably cannot take up a full-time job they uh, and there are boys even who quit later on 
so they could be made use of by introducing uh, these things. And I we can still keep them in the circle. Thank you, Aisha. Can I introduce and ask a question, put a question to Professor Bilkis Shabir? Uh, she is the head of the Department of Medicine at KE. And I will actually uh, put it uh, to her uh, a question, which is, uh, I think, a little bit tricky to sort out. And which is that, uh, what are the, uh, what is to be done to improve employment opportunities uh, for female doctors in smaller towns and rural clinics? I think that is a problem because of the environment uh, to work is not very conducive, mainly uh, security and other things as well. Um, uh, difficulty traveling, being away from the education opportunities. And I th if I could, after Bilkis's answer, could I put the same question to uh, Professor Yasmin Rashid as well? Thank you so um, much, uh, uh, Dr. Atta. And um, uh, 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 salam to Professor Yasmin Rashid and Professor Khalim Sukhbundu Sahab and Dr. Faisal Sultan. Um, the first uh, one thing I would like to make uh, clear is that I am a proud uh, graduate of Fatma Jinnah Medical University, like uh, Madam Yasmin Rashid. And out of the 30 years of my life uh, in medical uh, career, about 10 years have been spent at FJ, and uh, I would say about 16 years at King Edward, and the rest four at other institutes. So I'm well affiliated with uh, uh, King Edward, but I'm not a Timkonian. Um, um, the question is tricky, definitely, Dr. Atha, but uh, it is very close to my heart, especially, uh, you know, every, we very often we talk about COVID and how COVID has, you know, disrupted our lives. But to me, COVID has taught me a lot. And one of the things which uh, I would pay the attributes to uh, the Chancellor uh, the governor of Punjab and to Professor Rash, uh, Yasmin Rashid and uh, Professor Khalid Sulmonda. One of the opportunity which has uh, you know enlightened during these times of COVID in Pakistan is telemedicine, and I think one of the first talks uh, was on telemedicine. And I think that where the women are you know burdened with their family life and. Uh, you know, domestic pressures. Professor Aisha Shopat repeatedly mentioned the word parents and parents in law. So yes, there is pressure from sometimes parents. We were born to parents who were very, you know, conducive to our training. Or I think all the women on the forum, and probably they had wonderful husbands. I think three of the people on the uh, screen know my husband very well. And uh, like personally, I'm blessed with a wonderful husband. Yes, maybe that is the reason there was no, you know, uh, disruption in my career. But there are people who face these challenges. And I think work at home environment, I think COVID uh, has been best of the times when this has been introduced. This telemedicine, I think we can extend to the rural areas, to the less privileged areas, if we can provide network facilities, telemedicine facilities, and working at home facilities for the ladies who have graduated with flying colors, starting from their A levels, O levels, FSC, to medical school, I think whether it, may, whether it be KE or any other private uh, medical institute, I think the range of marks which they achieve in the M MCAT and the FSC A levels, O levels, is almost equivalent. I think they're all brilliant, and they are all. I think all doctors are, you know, cream of the nation. And I think if we can, you know, extend this facility where they cannot work. One is which everybody has talked about to teach and train the male members of the society, and you know, inculcate in them that females are as important. Many of the patients, they want to be seen by females. Professor Yasmin Rashid would very often talks about that. And we as females are ambassadors as doctors, and we are actually not dealing only with a single patient, but a whole family. When we are talking to a mother or a female member of the society uh, as a patient, we are talking to the whole of the family actually. Oh, and, uh, so uh, the thing is that maybe telemedicine can help oh, a lot. I'm sorry, uh, 
we have to because we're running uh, about uh, does she foresee uh, women doctors working in rural areas, basic health units, uh, in foreseeable future, uh, without any uh, difficulties there that they face now, madam? Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's an extremely important question that you have asked. Uh, basically, देखे मैं मैं मेरे लिए तो सबसे अहम चीज ये है कि एक लेडी डॉक्टर मौजूद होनी चाहिए अगर हम कोशिश करें कि हम हालात अपने मरीजों के ठीक करें तो बगैर एक फीमेल डॉक्टर के हमारा गुजारा ही नहीं एक काम तो वी हैव डन वन थिंग व्हिच हैज हेल्प्ड अस इन पुटिंग डॉक्टर्स इनटू द रूरल एरिया इज ऑल दोस गर्ल्स हु आर इंटरेस्टेड इन डूइंग देयर पोस्ट ग्रेजुएशन सो दे गेट एन एक्स्ट्रा मार्क्स फॉर Uh, central induction if they do their duties in basic health units or they do their duties in rural health centers that has at least encouraged women going into the rural area but what is extremely important is this family support the difficulty that arises is when girls have to go and work in the rural area is what sort of a family support are they going to get so when we are talking about a woman getting married what sort of a support she going to get from her husband would the husband be support enough to let her work where she has to go and work so as long as they are not married majority of them have been uh, at least the statistics that i have is there quite a few girls working in the rural area who are now preparing for their post graduate exams because they've done their part one they had acquired those extra marks and they are working there but once they get married if they do not get the sort of support that they require it might be very difficult for us to put women into the rural area we we've been encouraging that if a couple wants to go and work in a rural health center we try to put them there together because that would help it out we even try to put them into basic health units the situation has definitely improved over the years there was actually when there were more women coming out and the majority of them are not going in for post graduation yet would like to be employed by the government which we have at the moment since we came in we have employed more than 11000 doctors out of this a huge proportion of about more than 5000 women doctors who have been employed as medical officers and naturally once they've been employed by the primary and secondary healthcare system they have to go into the rural area because that's a part of their duty so the important part is uh, ensuring that they are facilitated when they go into the so for we are looking after their security is extremely important that they should feel secure when they're working in the rural areas uh it's important that there should be minimum political interference because particularly doctors working at rural health centers might have to give a medical certificates with uh, you know medical legal certificates and all that we are trying to get that away from um, these areas and trying to bring them at the level of the district at water hospitals so that uh, there's no involvement in the medical legal sort of work that which many at times women are reluctant because they naturally have to go into the courts afterwards if they give a medical legal certificate so we are trying to work on sorting out and improving the situation but a very important issue which came up is ensuring that we give them some sort of respite where the children are concerned so when daycare centers are concerned we are now bringing in a new program in which the women development uh, uh, department is going to work in very close collaboration with me to ensure that all our teaching hospitals have uh, a proper daycare center with uh, proper facilities and we should also be giving the facilities in rural areas particularly the tehsil headquarters and district headquarters hospital so that if a woman has to work there and she has a young baby and she has to uh, wants to take it, the child with her so she should be facilitated for that so we are working on it because our basic concern is that i mean it it really gives me a lot of uh, heartache when i see such a lot of money being spent on women being educated in public sector hospitals because majority of them do manage to come into the public sector hospitals and yet not being able to serve the people so we're trying to facilitate we're trying to bring them into the basic uh, sciences i mean they want to have flexi hours they can come into the basic sciences they can so we're trying our level best however it's as i said it's extremely important Uh, which i think everybody does well like people who are, what sort of a support are you get good get from your family i consider myself very lucky that i was married when i joined the medical college i had my first child when i was in first year medical college and uh, but i got a huge support from my husband 
from my in-laws and nothing would have been possible if I hadn't had that support. So it's extremely important that when a girl is getting married, she should always talk to the gentleman that she's going to get married to, that she's interested in working because she's a huge asset for our country and we would never like to waste her. And that's an extremely important thing is some sort of an understanding that she must always, even if they're flexi hours, we have now started working on tele uh, calls, you know, uh, telemedicine, if they can't do anything else, at least get themselves involved in telemedicine. So we are working on it, hopefully keeping fingers crossed, things might improve by the end of our tenure, or I think we might have some positive results. Excellent. Thank you, Madam. It's very nice to have you at the helm of affairs, somebody who's got insight and who has personal experience of dealing with all these problems. So the last two questions, I will ask uh, Saira to ask those two questions. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll ask the, uh, request the panelists to be uh, very brief in their answers. Thank you. Saira, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Athar. My question is from Dr. Farhat. You have talked about uh, different things, and uh, as we were talking about many things, we always think that uh, medicine is the art and science of prolonging life, promoting health, and preventing disease. What is your take about it? How do you think that this mixing should be done uh, as a female or a lady doctor? Thank you so much. And I'm really privileged to be a part of uh, you know, this panel. It's very August panel, very uh, academically, uh, academic achievers and all that. So I feel kind of out of place here also. So I, but your question is very valid. And I think you did ask that question having me in mind. So um, I just want to, uh, people have talked here, you know, about there was no discrimination they faced as, as women, you know, in KE at Mayo. So my perspective is a little different, and I will give you the perspective of quote unquote, uh, you know, mediocre student in case. So because remember, we are about, you know, 12, two dozen people sitting here, but there are three, there were 300 plus, 350 plus students in our class. So keep in mind when a medical student comes to, um, in Pakistan, you know, when, they, when we enter medical college, I was 17 years of age. In the United States, and I will come to the answer of your question, but let me, you know, went out a little bit. In the US, um, they graduate high school at 18 or 19. So it's an extremely tender age. It's an age where your mind is forming, your emotions, you know, so you're already. And then, you know, our society back then, and I don't know about now, I think it still is, is a, a little bit, you know, I can say that patriarchy is normalized, you know, male dominance is normalized. So from that standpoint, then you enter an institution, uh, which is um, which is a supreme institution. So, but when I said, you know, my experience was a little different. So when I talk about Kim K, I uh, think of certain things that are still sticking to mind. And I, you know, when I say mediocre, uh, please let me, uh, explain that um, throughout my me medical school, all the tests and pre-tests and stages and sub-stages and whatnot, you know, I, I didn't flunk a single one. I think the only one I flunked was a sub-stage of head and neck. That was my only uh, quote unquote uh, failure. So I was a reasonably good student, um, but I was the kind of student who would cram everything at the very end of the, you know, the ugly din and I would I would do fine. But I had the sense that, um, you know, uh, that was not something that was, I did not fit well into, into King Edward Medical College. Now, prior to that, I was at Kinaid. So when I think of institutions affecting my personality or the passion you are talking about or the personality you are talking about when I'm, I'm out there as a healer, I think of a lot of impact from Kinaid where again, I was a mediocre student. I had ended up in Kinaid, you know, as uh, uh, being very fortunate, but I was from a small school and my father was uh, a lieutenant colonel in the army. So I went to a very small public school and so the first time, you know, whenever there was an exam, I was, I think, 27th out of uh, um, uh, a class of 50 plus, which was a shock. Lekin, when the teacher, the physics teacher uh, get, handed me out the report, you know, she said, Farhat, you can do better. I did not get this from any of my teachers or many of my teachers at uh, K. So 
I won't say there are three generations sitting here because I don't want to, you know, tell people that you are old or I don't want to say that I'm middle-aged, which I am, or maybe past it. But at least there are three stages here. You know, there are teachers who, uh, there are people who are, who were our professors, our teachers, and then there are people who are now professors and teachers and sitting at those positions. And then the youngsters, I hope some of them are listening. So um, I hope the environment is changing because I, um, that one failure that I'm talking about, you know, that I, I really respected that uh, demonstrator, Wo Badne plastic surgeon, Beniti, she was an absolutely fine, you know, very like lady. But you know what she said, and then I was like, okay, I didn't prepare well, so probably that's why, you know, uh, I'm not doing well in the substage, but let's keep it to the point. And uh, she goes, um, Sara din, uh, extracurricular activities. Karti you. And then, you know, which professor I'm talking of that me, she had actually shouted out in the dissection hall saying, se karte ho, Sara padhti nahi. And, you know, honestly, I had a rheumatology ki board uh, fellowship, so I had a heart that I would take certificate and ja take you know, uh, table. Pe rakh dun. So these achievements are good, you know, but there, are, there is life beyond achievement. There is life beyond the resume, beyond the portfolio. And uh, so, so that, that part was lacking at KE. It was very much there in Kinet, where we were all women. Where again, I, as I said, you know, I was a mediocre student. But KE, you have some perspective there of, you know, maybe people who were um, always uh, studious. And I have all the respect for resumes and accolades and achievements. You know, those matter. And there's, but what mere mariz ko aaj agar mujhse fark padta tha, us cheez se padta ki mujhse baat kaise karti, kitna you know compassion hai treatment mein. And I don't think so in practical life. Most of uh, most of us, you know, most of our patients care, you know, mera kitna bada naam hai, except for obviously people like Dr. Fauci and some others, you know. Jim. But most of us in practice, and out of 350, you know, maybe 12 or uh, 25 will end up on these academic positions. Baki to humari tarah private practices mein hi hote hai. Anyway, as far as your question, yes, um, that is the most important thing, as I said, you know, compassion and um, passion and that you do not get from that. You get from the training that is outside the academic training because your academic knowledge is or your teachers who are training you or polishing you in academics are not the ones who will uh, tell you how to. So most of that I got from my training here as a, as a, as a med internal medicine resident and then the rheumatology fellowship. Another thing most of us said, um, uh, I heard that, you know, behind every successful woman, there is a man. And yes, I'm absolute mm -hmm. believer of that. And I really mm -hmm. uh, do uh, consider yes. my husband to be. Uh, but then again, you know, there are women who don't have uh, husbands, you know, uh, they, their successes should not be undermined. And there is a lot of those out there. So and my husband, by the way, is from Allah Akbar Medical College, but an absolutely wonderful person. So uh, that's all I have to say that, you know, let's hope, and I'm, I'm talking to Aisha Shokat, I'm talking to Bilkis Yabir, and uh, that let, when, when you um, have a class of 300 plus and there are students who uh, have other things to do in life and who may have other dreams and other, uh, they, they do consider that as part of their personalities also. You know, here, high school even if we're not doing well, nobody, tells say, says them you are not going to be able to do anything in life that is the thing that's stuck in my mind uh, from my stay in uh, you know, uh, i think it's are, much as you're an artist and a scientist <laughs> and a medic so therefore you bring a very uh, you know strongly needed perspective and proportion to this discussion so thank you very much for that i'm sorry we're running thank out you. of time so thank we you have to move on. We do have a surprise, a bonus five minutes at the end. So everybody keep guessing and please wait for that. Um, and uh, the last question, Saira will invite the last panelist of today uh, for this discussion before we move up on to a citation uh, by Faisal uh, to give the um, uh, award uh, to Madam Yasmin. So Saira to invite the last panelist. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Farhas. Your passion was just like as you are speaking your heart out and I was so absorbed in it that I couldn't uh, even ask you 
uh, that uh, how the different things has happened and how your teachers have molded your life. But it is wonderful how you have explained everything. My next Thank question you. is from Dr. Abira Bas. Uh, oncoplastic surgery. It needs a lot of commitment, dedication, time, and how your life balance that is maintained by an expert like you who has a name in oncoplastic breast surgery, Dr. Abira Bas. Thank you so much, Ira. I think I still have to make a name yet. <laughs> but uh, thank you for King Edward uh, for me being here. So I would just like to put on a few things. I would take the words of Dr. Yasmin Rashid. She, she said about lady doctors. I'm going to talk about lady surgeons, right? Uh, why I'm a surgeon today is because when I was in third year, I still remember a lady who came with a lump in her breast and she refused a male to examine her in King Edward. And I had to examine her and explain my findings describing that lump to the assistant professor there. So obviously that is the time when I thought, oh yes, I'll be a surgeon one day. And I think maybe because I like being <laughs> doing things with my hands, so here am I. The other thing that I want to point out is like, you've talked about a family support, but on the other, which we, I don't want to put on because obviously it's a repetition then. The thing about environment, right? In which just Dr. Farah Shaheen Shiri mentioned about. Environment is very important. So I will talk about the ground reality. I just did my house job at King Edward. I was, uh, I did it West Surgical Ward. Professor Tia Shah was the lead and Professor Gondal used to be assistant professor there. Okay. So now what's the environment there? It's a ward week, right? Is it compatible with any lifestyle? Any You guys are talking about part-time. So we used to do the award week. We stayed one week in that ward as house jobians. Uh, day and night looking after that patient. I don't know whether it's changed. Dr. Aisha Shokat might be able to tell us. Would that be inviting or would you be able to conv convince a girl to be a surgeon if you have, she has to stand for a stay for one week in the ward? So I think that's really inhumane for boys what to talk about girls, right? So anyway, I did it. I survived it. Here I am. The other thing I remember at that time when I did the house job, Surgery was the only specialty where the changeover used to happen at 6 a.m. in the morning. Again, is that human, <laughs> right? I remember my brother used to drop me and he would say, why you have to do this, right? Look, it's the only people who are awake at this time are just people who are sweeping the mall road, you know, in the morning. So obviously I would like to go to Shok to tell us, has it changed, right? Do we still have to wake up at 6 5.30 in the morning to reach for a change over shift for surgery is the only specialty I remember. Medicine used to change at 8, whatever, but obviously this is but Obviously, I did my house job there for six months, but I think these are the ground realities. If you want to have women in surgery, which obviously I am a part um, and a member at the Royal College of Surgeons as well, to invite and be a mentor for girls to, to be a surgeon, right? Because surgery, as you as we've been seeing the statistics presented by Dr. Aisha Shokat, women don't want to be surgeons, but how are you going to convince them? I can quote the example of the Royal College of Surgeons in England. In 1991, there were only 300 fellows, right? And now, in, now we have around 300 members of the fellows of the Royal College of Surgeons, right? We need not only female doctors, we have, in my class, which was around maybe 150 at KU, or something like that. Sarah might know the exact number of her class fellows. Sorry, but to interrupt. Those are surgeons. I, that I have to interrupt here. Uh, I know that uh, we haven't, we are all thirsty for the vessel uh, has to go. Um, so I think we, if we can have a citation for Madam and the presentation of award and talk and then we can carry on talking afterwards. Uh, so uh, Faisal Sultan, as you know, is the special advisor to the Prime Minister, former chief executive of the Shah uh, Sanam Hospital. Uh, plenty of achievements to his credit, and not the least the present handling of the COVID pandemic in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, Faisal will read the citation to present this Excellence in Public Life Award uh, to for Madam Yasmin Rashid. Faisal, go ahead. Thank you, and apologies for. <clears throat> Uh, causing this interruption, but uh, I do have to step away. So um, <clears throat> the citation that's been given to me, I'll read it out, but uh, Athar, with uh, apologies, I will add a couple of things that are not in there that are not in the public domain either. 
Uh, so, Dr. Yasmin Rashid, the current Health Minister of Punjab, um, and the citation is for the Kemka UK Excellence in Public Service Awards. Uh, we have heard uh, from um, uh, overachievers and achievers and, and really true stars uh, from both uh, from KE as well as from other colleges. Um, uh, and Dr. Yasmin is certainly uh, right up there in, in this category. Uh, she was uh, born in Chakwal in Punjab, Pakistan, uh, and uh, she completed her early education in Neela village in Chakwal, that's her home district, before she moved to Lahore uh, and where she was educated at the Convent of Jesus and Mary. This does not, the citation did not originally list the fact uh, that I had um, <clears throat> the privilege of living next door to her in, in Masroor, which was then known as Maripur, uh, where our parents were uh, <clears throat> colleagues in the Pakistan Air Force. Uh, so I've heard from my mother how studious uh, and serious uh, a young uh, woman as a, as, a, as a young girl she was back in the day. Uh, then onwards in 1978, she went uh, to do her MBBS from the Fatma Jinnah Medical College in Lahore. And uh, she has seen multiple leadership roles ever since her student days and many of which we have seen firsthand ourselves. She was the president of the Students' Union at FJ. And in 1984, she came to the UK and did her MRCOG in 1989. Uh, she was granted the fellowship of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 1999. And in her professional career, she's had uh, too many milestones to count, but she served as the president of the PMA for many years. Talk about breaking ceilings. Uh, she was the head of the uh, OBGYN department at uh, KEMU and has endeared herself to her students by being a diligent and professional teacher um, and, and a much loved one. She's also worked in the Rawalpindi Medical University, Fatma Jinnah Medical University, and headed uh, the gynecology department of the Central Park Medical College. She's kept um, <clears throat> up her commitment to social work uh, and has worked particularly for the people of Gilgit Baltistan. And I can tell you uh, that she's always, even currently on my case, to help um, uh, some interventions and plans uh, in GB. Uh, and which, inshallah, we will uh, make happen. Uh, in her political uh, career, she's been a tireless campaigner, and no matter which party you may uh, believe in, uh, but uh, you will always admire her absolute uh, tenaciousness and, and, and zeal in, in how she's cont contested elections, and I think everybody across the political spectrum recognizes this. She's a member of the Punjab Assembly and a member and a Minister of Health for the past three years. She's been working to improve the health outcomes for the province and bringing about major infrastructure changes and developments, including organizational reforms such as the autonomy of the medical teaching institutions, working on women's and children's health and developing uh, the thalassemia screening program. We recognize her uh, efforts in combating the COVID pandemic in Pakistan, the rapid development of uh, diagnostic and uh, therapeutic facilities and the rollout of a vaccine program. Uh, and all of this, uh, now talking about really being a superwoman, all of this uh, while she was herself um, going through personal health challenges uh, of a kind that most people would have um, stepped away from work uh, during them. And so this showed resilience and determination, uh, which really is almost unheard of. Uh, so I think for this, she has uh, achieved widespread admiration and respect, I think from across the country. We truly honor her devotion and energy, and in spite of the enormity of the task of providing universal health care to a province as large as Punjab, which is bigger than most countries. She's a great teacher, a devoted mother of four children, who are all grown up, um, of course, a veteran social worker, a popular political leader, and an icon for young doctors. It's a great privilege to have her work with us, uh, to have her with us today, and to give her the Kemka Excellence in Public Service Award. Um, I am personally honored and privileged to be able to present this uh, and as, a, as her colleague in, in, in this whole governmental health initiatives, I think uh, uh, I say it from the bottom of my heart, no one deserves this more than she does. I would like to invite her to talk about her work on healthcare in Punjab. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are all honored, uh, Madam, uh, so the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Faisal. I feel so humble when I hear all these things. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for the appreciation that you people are giving. I think I always believe because I became a doctor 
because of the passion of being a doctor. I couldn't get admission in the medical college and I got admitted in dental college and I spent my first three years in the dental college. And I always wanted to be a gynecologist. So I still remember when I got admission in uh, the medical college, I was, I just had a year to go to become a dentist. And my, I was expecting my daughter um, and everybody kept on discouraging me. My father asked me a very simple question and he asked me, okay, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a gynecologist. So he said, if you become a dentist, can you become a gynecologist? I said, no. He said, then why are you thinking about it? Then I said, I'm going to be a gynecologist. और उस दिन ये डिसीजन लेने के बाद मैंने एक दिन कभी इस चीज को रिग्रेट नहीं किया कि मुझे दोबारा से सारे स्टेजेस करने पड़े एनाटॉमी के हालांकि ये तो मैंने किए थे हेड एंड भी दोबारा करना पड़ा और दो हेड क्लियर दैट और ये सारी पढ़ाई एक दिन की रिग्रेट नहीं हुई बिकॉज़ आई फाइनली केम इनटू अ प्रोफेशन व्हिच आई लव एंड आई एक्चुअली लव माय प्रोफेशन एंड दैट इज वन रीजन व्हाई आई कंसीडर माय सेल्फ द लकीएस्ट ह्यूमन बीइंग ऑन दिस अर्थ दैट I could fight for the doctor's rights. And today I'm lucky that Imran Khan selected me for becoming the health minister because there were so many things that I thought if I ever have a chance to come into power, I might be able to accomplish. And Alhamdulillah, with all the support and I, you can't imagine what a huge support Faisal is. He's the shoulder that I normally cry on and he's the board that I normally go and, you know, given my ideas. And both of us, because of the because we work with the same passion, Alhamdulillah, there are quite few things that we have managed to accomplish. So I'm extremely grateful. However, I think this is an excellent opportunity that since we have a lot of our people from outside Pakistan to know what is happening in Pakistan, particularly their women and children are concerned. I had sent in my presentation. If I could have it, I could actually tell you what am I exactly doing or what you, are we trying to accomplish where the mother and child are concerned in Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Athar, I had a presentation. I had sent yes, presentation. Uh, Asad, can we pull it up? Thank you. All right. All right. If you look at the situation of mother and child health in Punjab, uh, सारी जिंदगी क्योंकि ऑब्सेट्रिक गायनी में मैं काम करती रही और हमेशा तकलीफ होती थी कि हम इसके बारे में कुछ नहीं कर पा रहे तो मुझे यही लगता था कि कभी जिंदगी में मौका मिले तो अब मैंने इसी के ऊपर काम करना है एक वक्त था जब मैं और शेरशाह मैं प्रेसिडेंट थी पाकिस्तान मेडिकल एसोसिएशन की और शेरशाह जो था वो जनरल सेक्रेटरी था वो भी गायनोकोलॉजिस था तो लोगों ने कहा कि इसका नाम बदल के पाकिस्तान मेडिकल एसोसिएशन से पाकिस्तान मैटरनिटी एसोसिएशन बना लो क्योंकि तुम सवाय मैटरनिटी के कोई और बात नहीं करते <laughs> मैं हंस पड़ी मैंने उससे कहा मैं लोगों से कहा कि बात यह है कि दुनिया जब देखती है ना आपको तो वो आपके जो सोशल इंडिकेटर्स देखती है वो ये देखती है कि आपको अपनी खातिन और बच्चों के बारे में कितनी कितना फिक्र है सो इंडिकेटर्स व्हिच विल ऑलवेज कम अप इंटरनेशनली आर the maternal mortality ratios, the neonatal mortality ratios, these and the under five mortality ratios because people around the world are concerned how are we looking after our most vulnerable people, which includes the women and children of Pakistan. So if you look at the maternal mortality ratio is 157 per 100,000 live births, neonatal is about 41 per 1,000 live births and under five mortality ratio is 69, it's much improved since the time I started working on, but not as I, uh, I, as I wanted. And we tried to analyze the situation. We had a huge workshop and I, once I became a minister, sat down, worked on it and tried to see what was wrong. And we understood that we are still having significant number of home births in rural areas and urban slums, which are the major cause of maternal deaths and neonatal deaths. And there was low utilization of public sector institutions. 
uh, we you can, don't think of Lady Wellington Hospital or Ganga Ram where you'll have two patients to a bed. But the, the government has a huge uh, network of facilities. And many a times, it's sad to see that the bed occupancy rate is comparatively much less in the rural areas and people would prefer to be delivered at home. Then lack of awareness of health issues was there. Then you, shortage of human resource for mother, mother and child. And then uh, limited facilities. And then of course, we are now going through a population explosion for which both myself and uh, Faisal are extremely worried because if we continue at this rate, then whatever resources that we dedicate to health, we might never be able to really serve the people of Pakistan if we don't bring about some sort of reduction in our growth rate. Uh, so the first step that we took as a government was that uh, we went on to, uh, can we go on to our next slide? So we went on to developing a Punjab health sector strategy which was done after a huge, and we published into, we came in in 2018 and we published this in 2019, March. And this was a comprehensive document giving a 10 years program on how are we going to work and improve the situation. And we kept ourselves focused on the SDGs, particularly one and two, because they basically deal with maternal mortalities and they deal with neonatal mortalities, with nutrition of children, with malnutrition, stunting of growth. So we started working according to that. And the first thing which came into our mind is improving the situation where uh, uh, resources were concerned, where infrastructure was concerned, and where the human resource was concerned. Let me tell you, since we have come in, you will be absolutely astonished. That's one slide I forgot to enter into it. We have employed more than 40,000 people in our health services, which were vacant posts and nobody had thought of employing these people, which includes about 11,000 doctors, which includes about 10,000 nurses. We talk about pharmacists, we talk about physiotherapists, we're talking about the first time we've also employed male nurses. And then what we thought was extremely important that we establish mother and child hospitals, particularly in our rural areas. So look at the areas where we are developing it. Atak, Laya, Rajanpur, Pawal Nagar, Miyawali, Lahore, because Gangaram Hospital, my heart always beats there. And I always thought the amount of services that they give, we never had enough of facilities. We are now putting up a 650 bedded mother and child hospital with subspecialities like fetal medicine, gynecological oncology, urogynecology, and of course, assisted reproduction. Then we have established a child health university in Lahore by upgradation the Institute of Child Health because we require indigenous research, we require indigenous work here in Pakistan, particularly in Punjab, if you really want to improve the services. We are trying to get our basic health units to provide birthing services. And up till now, we have upgraded about 1,234 basic health units, so it worked 24-7. And then the most important thing was redesigning our uplifting of the nursing and midwifery curriculum. Uh, you'll be astonished that now all the medical schools have been converted into, uh, uh, sorry, the nursing schools have been converted into uh, nursing colleges. And now we're developing two institutions which are going to be uh, colleges of midwifery so that we upgrade the training and have better support staff for the medical professionals there. Because basically I believe that it's extremely important that the midwives should be properly trained and our nurses should be properly trained if you want to. Uh, work on it. Then we looked up where the ch child health care was concerned. All our uh, district headquarters hospitals and now the rural health centers, we are developing nurseries and neonatal ICUs and new nurseries are being established in majority of the rural health centers. We're starting with initially with eight districts with high mortality rates and we are going to continue putting up, uh, uh, improving, increasing the number of uh, nurseries. Then where EPI vaccination is, of course, we all believe that prevention is better than cure. And uh, what was sad that we had really not been concentrating on it. Since we have come in, Alhamdulillah, I'll show you the figures at the end. We have increased our EPI by uh, employing more vaccinators, by ensuring that they're proper, uh, uh, we have proper, you know, uh, uh, the work is being done around the clock in all the basic health units. Vaccines have been provided right down to the level of basic health units. 
and that has really helped in improving and we have gone to about 90% of vaccination among the infants who are now coming in fact that's the sort of figure we got from the big survey which uh, uh, unicef came and then of course providing provision of malnutrition treatment services for children I mean, absolutely shocking to see the malnutrition we never believed it's something you have to see it to believe it the malnutrition and something of growth and therefore we have put our special centers and civilization for these complicated malnutrition children malnourished children the next is what we are trying to do is of course can i have the next uh, slide please is family planning services that's the of course the key word uh, you'd be astonished we have employed we have 45000 lady health workers working at the grassroots level however compliance to family planning is still as low as 25% although awareness when we talk about awareness 90% of people are aware and one of the reasons that compliance has not been so good is because um, uh, the thing is this, nobody ever paid proper attention to it. The president of Pakistan, uh, Dr. Alvi, has now taken it up as a task, which he has given to myself and uh, uh, Faisal, and inshallah, we'll be working on it to ensure that we improve the availability of contraceptives right at the grassroots level. We increase the health awareness and education of women, particularly health education, so that women start working uh, uh, regarding their uh, uh, family spacing and their own health, which is extremely important. So I think uh, hopefully, inshallah, we might be able to make a small dent in the next couple of years since we are, this is one big uh, uh, issue that we are bringing up. So uh, the next thing is inclusion of, is one of the biggest thing that we are doing is, and I think uh, hats off to Imran Khan, because I still remember when he we had already given um, uh, universal health coverage to universal health insurance to about 35% uh, uh, of our population in Punjab, the poorest of the poor. And then suddenly, uh, because of the experience that he was facing, seeing in Khairat Pakhtunkha, at one of the meetings, he said, Dr. Saiba, we are going to give uh, health cards to every family in Punjab. So I went into a state of shock for a second, you know. Because I was already, we were already paying more than 20 billion rupees for the health insurance, particularly for the 35 persons. So I looked at his face and I said, sir, I hope you understand the amount of money which is going to be involved in it. So I said, I'm going to tell you that 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 I'm going to tell you उन्होंने मुझे कहा कि जब आप इجتماعی बेहतरी का कोई काम करते हैं तो हमेशा याद रखिए कि अल्लाह ताला इसमें जरूर साथ देता है और जब कोई इंसान बीमार होता है वो चाहे मिडिल क्लास का भी बंदा हो तो कई दफा हेल्थ शॉप जो है उनके लिए भी उतना ही बुरा होता है जितना लोग जो गरीब लोग होते हैं तो हमें कोशिश करनी चाहिए कि पाकिस्तान का और कम से कम पंजाब में जहां आप बैठी हुई हैं हर इंसान का हक है कि उसको कम से कम उसकी बीमारी में इंडोर सर्विसेज के लिए उसके पास हेल्थ कार्ड जरूर कोई पता नहीं होता लोग सफेद पोश होते हैं आपके सामने शायद जिक्र ना कर सकें लेकिन यह है कि कई दफा उनके पास पैसे नहीं होते तो अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह 720000 720000 व्हिच कैन बी एक्सटेंडेबल अप एवरी फैमिली इन पंजाब बाय 31st ऑफ डिसेंबर एंड आई एम वेरी प्राउड ऑफ इट बिकॉज़ वी ऑलरेडी स्टार्टेड वर्किंग ऑन इट एंड अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह uh, we have already managed to <coughs> impanel more than 85 lakh families. 85 lakh families already, joined, they are a part of our program. Or our total, which we have done, that is two uh, crore and 93 lakh. So it's it's huge. It's huge, and it involves a hundred billion rupees. And this time, I was very lucky. None of the ministers are happy with me because I seem to have taken away all the budget. But I have the largest budget. I have what 370 billion rupees given to me to improve the health services in Pakistan. And inshallah, inshallah, the niyat achhi ho aur aap istamai bethri ka jab soch rahe hote, to Allah Taala halat khud behtar karta hai. We managed to get that 100 billion rupees, and we're working on it. Faisal is working on the procurement of that insurance, and very soon, inshallah, this good news will be given to everybody in Punjab 
which by itself will be a huge support to the people. Uh, the last is a slide that I just wanted to present to you that for the last couple of years, we, since we, we focused on health, then which is of course Imran Khan's priority. If you remember his first speech, if you have heard his speech, then you will remember that he had taken an X-ray and that there was a problem in shunted growth. And how much of a concern was the malnutrition. That's why I and Faisal are very happy in this problem. That in the health of Imran Khan Sahib is not a compromise. And all our demands are going to be completed. And that's why at this time, the most important thing is that the health of the health खैबर पख्तूनखा के अंदर दोबारा हकूमत तरीके इंसाब की सिर्फ इस वजह से आई कि सेहत के निजाम को बेहतर करना इन्होंने और इंशाल्लाह जिस तरह फैसल आपको बता रहा है हम इंशाल्लाह एमटीआई एक्ट जो है वो ऑलरेडी मेयो पे लग गया है एंड वी हैव ऑलरेडी इंप्लीमेंटेड इन सियालकोट वी आर डूइंग अ पायलट इन दीस टू बिग हॉस्पिटल्स एंड इंशाल्लाह बाय नेक्स्ट ईयर वंस वी गेट आवर थर्ड पार्टी इवैल्यूएशन we will be implementing the MTI Act, which is going to, I'm 100% sure, produce much better results where management is concerned. PKLI, which was a big question, a lot of people were, America wale doctor also the boss shakayate hain hain suni. Yeh PKLI, but I'll tell you that PKLI, mashallah, is doing well. Faisal Dar, who's again a graduate of KE Medical College, usko bichare ko humne, wo khedna wali baat hai, wo achha khasa private sector mein kaam kar raha tha. He's now become the dean of PKLI and Alhamdulillah, we have done more than in the last uh, nine months since he has joined us, eight months, we have done more than 84 uh, liver transplants. He's done pediatric liver transplants. They have done more than 200 kidney transplants. Things have started moving up and inshallah, we're going to develop that uh, institution into an institution which would be good even for um, uh, uh, medical tourism because it has all the required need. And look, I was saying that because they made it with Shabazz Sharif, I said that this is made with people's money. So this is a trust. We should try as much as we can to do it. We should do it with any hospital. And we should give all the support to the people. So you can see that the immunization coverage has also increased. हम हर तरीके से कोशिश कर रहे हैं आप दुआ कीजिए कि अल्लाह ताला हम सबको हिम्मत दे कि हम पाकिस्तान के जो मेडिकल सर्विसेज हैं उनको जितना इंप्रूव करें उतना फायदा है वजह ये है कि मैं तो हमेशा ये बात बिलीव करती हूँ सेहत से बड़ी नेमत कोई और नहीं है आई वाज ट्रैवलिंग इन स्कर्दू आई वुड अ वेरी क्लोज a young girl of about seven years old who was carrying her younger brother who must have been about a year or so. And both of them had a huge smile on their face when I got down to talk to them. And that smile could only come because of health, because they were two very healthy children, you know. And I believe that smile, to put a smile back on people's face is what's the most important duty that we must form, perform as doctors because I'm very grateful to the team I'm very, very happy with the sort of support I'm getting from all my colleagues, my students, and everybody in all the institutions. They're going out of the way to ensure that better and better services are given. And we have a stunning example where COVID management has been concerned. I didn't want to talk a lot about it because I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. But Alhamdulillah, COVID management has been tremendous on behalf of all the doctors who have worked. I really want to on behalf of the government, I really want to thank them for the tremendous amount of effort they've made. Aap heran ho ge ke mujhe phone aaya, Dr. Aap Muha hai, aapke Majid sahab hai, jo aapke ambassador hai, wo zikar kar rahe te, ke bade achha performance hai COVID ka. To Dr. Sahiba ko khas, khas kisam ke jo steps liye ho. Mene ke ji, mene to apne halat dekhne, dekhte saari, पहले तो सबको कहा कि आयत करीमा पढ़ना शुरू कर दो। वजह ये है कि ये अल्लाह ही है जो बचाएगा हमें। हम इन्शाल्लाह और मैं आप यकीनन आपको बता रही हूँ, there is absolutely no scientific reason to explain why Pakistan has done better. Of course, everybody has worked very hard, but I'm sure all other countries worked equally hard. 
बट आई मेनी अ टाइम आई थिंक द पीपल हु आर सिटिंग एट हेल्प हेल्प ऑफ अफेयर्स अल्लाह ताला उनकी भी नियत देखता है शुक्र है खुदा का इस वक्त भी वी आर गोइंग थ्रू आवर फोर्थ वेव थिंग्स आर गुड दे आर अंडर कंट्रोल आइंदा भी अल्लाह खैर करेगा इंशाल्लाह कीप ऑन प्रेइंग फॉर पाकिस्तान एंड फॉर ऑल ऑफ यू हैव हैप्पी इंडिपेंडेंस डे बिकॉज़ ऑल पीपल अक्रॉस द ग्लोब हु आर पाकिस्तानीस उनका दिल तो पाकिस्तान में ही धड़कता रहेगा जो मर्जी हो जाए पाकिस्तान का झटका देख के दिल धड़कना शुरू हो जाता है तो आप सबकी बहुत मेहरबानी मैं बहुत ज्यादा शुक्र गुजार हूँ कि आप लोगों ने मेरे मुझे जो एहसास दे रहे हैं आई फील वेरी हम्बल अबाउटिंग वो सबसे बड़ा इनाम होता है मैं हमेशा परेशान होती हूँ जब एक मरीज को मैं नुस्खा लिख के दू और मरीज वापसी पे आके कहे कि मैं ठीक नहीं हुई तो मैं सोचती हूँ कि मैंने क्या गलती की कि ये मरीज ठीक नहीं हुई मेरा ख्याल दैट इज वन ऑफ द बिगेस्ट अकाउंट बट एनी वे इट वॉज नाइस हेयरिंग एवरीबडी टॉकिंग अबाउट इट एंड ऑफकोर्स आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू सी दैट वेमेन आर मेकिंग सच अट ऑफ एफर्ट आई एम श्योर यू ये हम जो मर्जी कह लें आप चंद मर्द या खड़े हुए ये औरत बड़ी रिजिलेंट होती है शी हैज बीन मेड टफ बाई अल्लाह त she has capacity to do much more than men because she is a procreator and therefore she is a tougher person and i show you don't ever all the ladies sitting here don't ever underestimate yourself always always understand that you are the strongest of the people living in the world and you really want to do something you will manage to accomplish it wo jo ek tasveer aapko dikhai thi na usme k2 ke bahar Well, this was a. I took a. I went to the base camp of K2 in uh, 2001. I was 51 years old at that time. Sorry, the world told me, "You can't go. You are too big. You are too fast. 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 everybody wrong if you are determined and i'm 100% sure all of you are such successful women that you are determined but then you must wo wali baat hai ke aap logo ne jo apni ye baatein hain ye auron ko jab convey karenge to ye sabse bada sadka jaari hoga bahut shukriya thank you so much thank you so much madam um i think uh, we have uh, run seriously over time but everybody was absolutely riveted listening to you and uh, i think we didn't realize uh, how time has flown um we do believe uh, all of us men here that uh, women are the superior and stronger of the two sexes <laughs> you are uh, a living example of that um i think what uh, with apologies to those people who i was not able to include in this discussion uh, i will hand over to uh, tabinda to uh, give the concluding remarks and then we will finish this session but there is a bonus 5 minutes for those people who want to stay on including madam thank you very much over to tabinda thank you very much atar and thank you uh, dr yasmin rashid for your very very kind remarks just a personal remark that i was also your neighbor at one time and i'm three children from my family were born with dr nazar tashraf and we saw how well supported she was as well by her husband so i guess long tradition of being supported and i think that um so much positive energy being brought to this um forum by so many successful women and i felt so inspired i did have those moments i do have those moments and i think we all do when we feel a bit despondent but i felt so positive after all this positive energy coming from like three continents so i i'm sure the future is bright and the future is going to be good for all of us and those husbands that got mentioned were all good husbands and i think the husbands that didn't get mentioned were the ones who didn't quite perform up to standard so i hope that uh, mothers who are raising boys will raise those boys to be men who would be supportive and i think that is the most important investment because it's sometimes hard to change things as they are but i think we can always invest in future so all those who are doing this uh, should do it properly and i guess Uh, the the things that could be perhaps inculcated uh, over into us uh, more compassion as far as said that compassion is the most useful tool that we can get into our lives uh, because most of the conditions are chronic conditions i as a physician speak like that that i can't cure so many things but i can uh, definitely support my patients compassion is a big thing 
And of course, I was really heartened by the <laughs> flexible working that is being introduced in Pakistan. So I think things will get better and they're looking like they're getting better. And so many reforms happening in Pakistan, thanks to all the work that's being done by Dr. Yasmin Rashid and her team. And of course, special mention also to the COVID and the letters that being, uh, are being written uh, about the COVID situation in Pakistan to us so that we can get out of the out of the red to Ember so that we can visit our parents and, and, and can also go back and make some difference whenever we can. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Khalid Masood Gondal as well. Uh, thank you to all the participants from the US who had a very unsociable hour and the speakers who uh, really did ever so well and really, you know, my heart was so much lighter after listening to all of you. So I conclude this and um, thank you ever so much to the management who arranged this, Tafel, a, a special thanks because nobody else is going to say thanks to you. Thank you very much, Tafel, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to gather all these people who, who have been such a source of uh, inspiration to me at least, and, and I guess to so many people when this recording goes up. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for being there now. Thank you. Thank you. So the official webinar is now concluded and uh, it is my pleasure to bring this uh, pleasant surprise bonus session for you. I want to tell you about Farad Shireen, which is a major poet in Urdu poetry. And you have recognized that people have not only been in Pakistan, but also in America, where the world is Urdu spoken. और उनका स्टाइल इवॉल्व हुआ है डेवलप हुआ है ओवर द इयर्स मैंने उनको एज अ मेजर पोइट डेवलप होते हुए देखा है राइट फ्रॉम द टाइम व्हेन शी वाज स्टूडेंट एट कैनेट कॉलेज एंड देन एंटर्ड इनटू द के मेडिकल कॉलेज तो फरहत मैं आपको दावत देता हूं कि आप अपनी शायरी से हमें नवाजें और ताकि हम सब लोग आपके आर्ट से भी नई महसूस हो सके जितना Thank you so much, Atars. Thank you for the very kind words again. And thank you for my introduction. I hope uh, this introduction will um, you know, let people forego and forgive some of the things that I said because you know, maybe it was not a forum for that, but I got carried away. It was like, you know, somebody from the slums of uh, Ticho uh, Malia ending up, you know, on the uh, uh, in Wall Street General uh, uh, Wall Street. So I was just overwhelmed. So, anyways, so um, my Mary Jo Nazm hai wo atar ne kata something positive about women, you know. So I chose a poem uh, which is uh, the title is Gul Rukh, and uh, it's actually I'm dedicating it to all the men out there, um, and including the men in this um, in this webinar. And you will know why I'm dedicating it to the men because I think it speaks of, of you and from your heart. Dhoop thale pahaat par us basti mein abhi Pandra bees makaan aur ek dargah ka zina Chimni se uthte surmai wo bhed se badal Aksar mujh ko yaad aate hain Raat ki chup ya din ki gehma gehmi ho एक साया खामोश सा मुझको तकता है सर्द हवा में जैसे अब भी हिना की खुशबू ठहरी है शाम ढले बूंदों की रिमझिम फर्श पे बराकी शफाक के दस्तर खान तांबे के थाल में चुके मह, चुने महकते ये पकवान और समावारों से उठती भाप का बादल लकड़ी की दीवारों से लकड़ी की और समावारों से उठती भाप का बादल लकड़ी की दीवारों पर नम कतरों से कुछ लिखता है तो नीलम में फिर याद का चांद उतरता है मुझसे फिर कश्मीर मेरी कुल रुख की बातें करता है जाफरान के खेत चनारों के पत्तों में आग लगाते सूरज के सेंदूर का जादू अब भी मुझे बुलाता है आलूचे बादाम के फूलों से जब हवा के जूड़े सचते हैं हरी भरी शाखें फिर नहीं नई बहार का आंचल ओढ़ती हैं दूर कहीं चक्की पे पिसती गंदम की खुशबू से लिपटी एक याद के पिखली मोम सी हाथ चलाती है शायद अब भी मौसम उससे पूछ के चाल बदलते होंगे शायद अब भी मौसम उससे पूछ के चाल बदलते होंगे पश्मीने से पांव वो इसके रंग बरंगे नमदों पर जब चलते होंगे अब भी दीपक जलते होंगे 
रूई के गालों जैसे इस रूई के गालों जैसे इसके हाथ से काढ़े तकिए पर सपने कहाँ बहलते होंगे झरने इसकी सरगोशी से जलते होंगे पूर्णिमा की भीगी रात सी जुल्फ रो पहली उस झुमके से जो उलझती होगी तो रंगों की एक होली सी अब भी यूं ही सचती होगी गुजरे वक्त की कर्द से अटी किताब में शायद अब भी मीठे दर्द से लिखी कहीं तो मेरी कहानी होगी अंगारों में दबी सी एक जवानी होगी कांधे के दो शाले में खुशबू भी वही पुरानी होगी छत पर सूखती मिर्चों के अंबार तले पिछली गर्मी की कोई खुबानी होगी थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू अता Thank you. I think uh, we are concluding now. So till next time, good afternoon.